Okay guys, I'm so sorry, I'm back. Oh, I knew, I knew, I knew something was gonna try to stop it tonight. And so I've been praying. Um, so Yavi, please help. Yavi helped us. Okay, so guys, go ahead and come back on live. We're here now. And so let me just um, wait for some of you to find me again because, yeah, I knew, I just knew it. I knew that I felt there was going to be a big spiritual attack again. Hi, Carissa. I really do. <laughs> I like, I know people are trying to silence this. I just know that for a fact. Um, so let me t message Danielle and tell her that we're back on and, and did everybody else, hopefully the other people will find us. Let's see here. Gosh. Okay, so yeah, Yahweh bless. Okay, there's Danielle. Yeah, I know. So you guys just keep praying because I know that Father has told me there's people trying to stop this. Hi, Angela. Hi, Isabel. Sorry. Um, Yahweh knows. He is good. He will help us. Um, yes, you're here. So I was going to message you. Now let me see here. Okay, I'll say we're back on. Um, okay. So yeah, you guys just pray. Pray that Yahweh keeps us live and that Satan doesn't come in and hinder. Oh, you know how he tries to silence the truth. Um, but you guys, now let's talk, since everybody's on here, would you guys, what book of the Bible do you want to go through? Some people had mentioned last night, Acts, 2 Corinthians. Hi, Kimberly. I'm so sorry that happened. Um, we're going to keep trying. Father God, please set guard over this. Let the enemy not silence this. Please, Lord. Please bless this fellowship and come and be here, Yahweh. And so, I don't know if I need to update my phone, but ever since, um, yeah, I, <laughs> there's just, there's some weird stuff that happens sometimes, and I think Satan really tries, tries to, oh, Hosea, okay, we, and we just went through that a few weeks ago. That would be another good one. Do you guys, what do you guys, okay, everybody vote. We are chicken. We ate chicken. We are chicken. <laughs> Sorry, we ate chicken. <laughs> hey, Isabel. Hi, Joe. Shalom. Hey, Isabel, I have chickens. Thank you, Kimberly. <laughs> Isabel, I have chickens. And so I'm going to teach you how to sound like chicken. Do you have chickens, Isabel? Do you have chickens? Thank you guys for praying. Keep praying. Um, do you guys have chickens? Anybody? Hi, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. It's the best day of the week. Yay. Um, we had, people are telling us, oh, so, Aunt, okay, you guys do have chickens. So, Isabel, you can make those sounds. Hi, Mary. I'm so sorry that that cut out there. Keep praying. I know Satan always is trying to silence me. I literally have people go on my page and I try to delete it, but they'll say that they'll like pray that Jesus rebukes me and silences me and never lets anybody hear me. So I try to delete all those comments, <laughs> but witchcraft is real. I mean, so, but we keep going and we keep smiling and we just, hi, shalom, Deborah, Deborah, Deborah. I always say it in Hebrew. Okay, so we had one vote for the book of Hosea. Shalom, Amanda, Shabbat shalom. We had one book for the, one vote for the book of Hosea. <clears throat> so you guys tell me. What, let's do like a, a, a number of. Um, how did I do? How did I do, Isabel? <laughs> um, okay, you guys. So um, hi, Jenny. So you guys, what book? Okay, so we had one vote for Hosea. Does anybody other? Does anybody else have questions about stuff? Because. It's kind of a free night. It's Friday night. It's Sabbath. Nobody's going to be working. We don't have anywhere to go in the morning because it's Yahweh's day. Praise Yahweh for his day. So any questions? Anything you like covered? I know Danielle just said the book of Hosea. Shalom, my cousin Tracy. Um, good. Yeah, okay, good. Chickens are dope. Yep. <laughs> they are very nice. Um, okay, so you guys, what book do you want to go through? Does Hosea sound good? If everybody wants Hosea, let's get like, how do I tell if that's thumbs up from everybody? Can you like comment your name and say yes? Because I'm still a little old and a little new to the game. Um, if you want to go through the book of Hosea, like Danielle suggested, or, okay, Exodus is a little long right now. I'm, I'm going to vote no for Exodus. <laughs> okay, but yes, Hosea. Hosea is good. Um, just because... Okay, perfect. We'll go through Hosea. 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 Hosea is such a beautiful, beautiful prophetic picture. Um, <clears throat> okay, so let's turn to Hosea. 
this is why it's okay to never prepare because <laughs> I don't prepare anyway. <laughs> I've read the Bible so many times, so I just show up. Oh, yes, I know. And it is good, Danielle. It is good. Oh, James is a really good book too. Okay, everybody had said yes to Hosea. Mm, and somebody asked for Colossians earlier too and then Acts yesterday. So I was just praying about it. But if everybody's okay with Hosea, I think it's a really, really good book prophetically. Um, okay, one second. I left my lotion over there. Usually it's right here. <laughs> because my brain doesn't work if my hands are dry. <laughs> any other women feel me? I'm sure the men do not have any comprehension of that. You men are able to have leather and sandpaper hands, but my brain shuts down if my hands are dry. <laughs> okay, so let's go through the book of Hosea. I'm gonna give it just a few more minutes. Keep praying that the Father would be here tonight and anointed and not let this be shut down. I know there's <laughs> lots of nice people out there who don't wanna hear us, <laughs> who don't want us to speak. Um, I was obviously being a little facetious there, but so Isabel, what'd you learn in school today? Did mommy teach you something really cool or do you have Fridays off to prepare for Sabbath? That's what I did with my son. We, we did school Monday through Thursday and we took Fridays off. Um, and he finished very early, like, like age 15, he was old done with everything and had done college classes. Oh my gosh. I really want to drink this and I put the lid on tightly. <laughs> okay. Shalom guys. Hey, so as we're waiting for people, I just want to give a few minutes, guys, because I know, anyway, um, what what testimonies today, what did God speak to your heart? Anything you guys can share that the Father was speaking with you? Like, what about your life? I feel so bad, Fridays off normally. Good. Um, I feel so bad being the only voice on here, but I don't know how to get other voices on the Facebook Lives. So, I would rather hear from you guys sometimes. Can you tell me what you do today? Anything fun? Hi, Jenna. Shalom. Anything exciting today happen? Did you get to share with people today? Or do you have testimonials? Anybody want to type that out? <laughs> I know it's kind of a bit, but sometimes even just a few words just to encourage each other. Um, I had a good opportunity tonight with a young lady who we uh, did. I got to do the photos for a beautiful family, the the father was killed of these four young children a couple years, two years ago, actually this month. And so we got to, I got to be with them. I shared the Torah. Yay! Praise Yahweh. Shabbat Shalom. I'm glad you got to share, Mary. I'm glad you got, hi, Rosa. Shalom, Shalom. Went to school to practice for my welding test coming up. Oh, cool. That's awesome. I am afraid of welding. <laughs> I do construction with my husband, but I'm afraid of the welder because those sparks. So you're very brave. Good for you. Hi there. Happy Friday. Shalom, shalom. Shabbat shalom, Sarah. Um, that's that's really awesome. So are you going to be a professional welder? Is that what you're going to do? Like as like, Or you just want to learn how to do it for some... Well, I guess you just tell me. What are you doing the welding for? Anything in particular? Is anything neat? Awesome. I took a long nap. Oh, don't brag. Angela, that's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Praise Yahweh that you got a nap. Um, if you want specific people at certain times to speak, I think that's what the button is for. Oh, so there's a button. <laughs> okay, I see buttons. I see the star thing. I see a microphone. And then I see, I'm not going to push the wrong button right now, but I will look at it later. Caught up on cleaning and did some painting. Oh, that's awesome. Shalom, shalom. Okay, perfect. So we're waiting for just, I'm just going to wait a few more minutes just to see you guys. Um, had a little wine. Well, that's nice that you guys got to kind of like relax and enjoy your time. And then we talked about somebody made um, crock pot chicken burritos for dinner and somebody made chicken. Isabel played and sang her God songs all through the grocery store saying, <laughs> Isabel, I want to go shopping with you. I want to go shopping with you. Let's just like... That's awesome. Shalom, guys. Okay, so we're going to wait. Let's just wait three more minutes. Let's give it to 720 and see who joins in. And then we're going to be going through the book of Hosea. 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 It is one of the most prophetic books that most people misunderstand and don't have any comprehension what they're reading. And once you see it tonight, you'll never unsee it. <laughs> you'll never unsee. Hi, Lori. Shalom. So you'll never unsee what we're talking about in the book of Hosea tonight. So because if people are on... If they have never gone through this book, they just have no clue. I know, I love her joyful heart too. I love just her loud singing. 
I want to build, but I'm trying to leave it to God to guide me. I would, it would be cool to build a small house. Yeah, my husband's a general contractor. It is cool. So I do construction like right beside him. So you would really love that skill. Um, hi, Lori. Shalom. How's Sina? How's everybody doing, Miss Lori? Okay, guys, we're going to give it two more minutes, and then we're going to start reading through the book of Hosea. I went to the courthouse trying to be brave about a former problem. Oh, well, I pray Yahweh was with you. <clears throat> I um, don't need to know the specifics, but I pray Father guides you and leads you. Thank you from Isabel. Yeah, so Isabel, do you think you can come out to Wyoming someday? Do you think you can come out here? And then we'll just have some fun. Like, you can have so much fun. We'll go shopping together. <laughs> we'll tell the whole world about God, okay? We'll tell the whole world, okay? You are my, you're going to be my hype girl. <laughs> or I'll be your hype girl. How about that? Whatever. Okay, we're going to wait one more minute. One more minute. Oh, yes, yeah, that'd be fun. Miss Danielle got to come out here to a uh, year and a, a year ago. Oh, my God. Goodness, she came during the worst snowstorm ever. It was like 25 below zero. Shalom, Libby. Awesome. You made it in time. We haven't started yet. We're just waiting for people. We were going to wait till 7.20, and then we're going to read through the book of Hosea tonight because we just kind of took a vote tonight. And also, like, there's so many books that we could go through, and everybody has different suggestions at different times. Okay, so it is 7.20. No, it's 7.19. 7.19. Isabel would love being there with your animals. I know. And my animals are so sweet. Like, they're so sweet. I go, yeah, well, I pray he guides you, Jenna. Okay, 720, the teacher in me says we must go. Okay, I have a severe learning disability. I struggle with reading comprehension. Oh, awesome. And Joe, please don't feel bad. And then I have the podcast as well. I don't know if you saw the podcast I make because it's an audio thing. <clears throat> I was, a, so when I taught second grade, my cousin, okay, so I was a teacher. I was like, okay, young. And then my cousin, he was in sixth grade at the time. And he has a learning disability, but he's brilliant, right? So at age five, that little stinker could take the bobcat and the skid steer and the and, and, and he could set grade on a plumbing line like completely. He could get in that skid steer and he would completely set grade the whole way down, doing those trenches and everything. He knew which which pieces went where. He could do the whole job with my grand with my step grandpa. And so his teacher and I were in the same school and his teacher came to me and said something about why is your cousin such a box of rocks and I said that boy's probably the smartest kid you have in your class he's not ever going to read and write well he's never going to comprehend things in that manner but that kid can do more than most kids and he's smart and I, I bet you to this day he I mean I don't we're not in contact a lot right now um but he was brilliant so never let somebody make you feel dumb for not being book smart hi Morgan how's that tummy how far is it out today <laughs> If you guys want to see, like, the cutest pregnant baby in the world, you need to, or the pregnant belly in the world, you need to see Morgan. Like, legit. Like, I think there's nothing more beautiful than a pregnant woman. Me too. Or exactly. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, we'll be praying for you. Let's pray for you. Okay, guys, let's start with prayer. Oh, yeah, the Elohim. Thank you, Lord. Please let this study keep going. Don't let anybody silence it. Don't let Satan silence it. Please come and be our teacher. Don't let us thwart your ways. Don't let us twist your words. May we just seek your heart and hear from you. Father God, I lift up Joel right now that you would heal his body. Lord, rebuke that affliction and, and the disability in him. Father God, that he can glorify you in, in, in the healing. But Father God, of course, we always say if it's your will, let him glorify you through the trials that he would praise your name and, and be a witness to you that no matter what, he's never going to turn away from you. Father God, please heal Jenna's heart. Please heal Donna's heart. Please, Father God, I, I beg you to all the afflictions that are out there right now, um, would you please heal everybody who's listening and for Danielle, her, her situation and anything with Mary or Christy or anybody, Father God, and, and Angela, Lord, help anybody who's breaking off addictions of smoking, Yahweh, beg you to save us, save your children. Not me, I don't smoke, but I meant like, just, I put myself in us, we're together, we're one body. Father God, would you please make us one in you and help us to glorify you in everything we do. Would you please be glorified in this Shabbat? Please provide for your children. Please lead and guide everyone. Please rebuke those demons. Help Spencer to overcome. Help him to rise up the man, as the man of that family filled with joy and love for you. Please help strengthen Nicole, um, Heather as she's going through this and all of, all of your children, Father God. Oh, thank you so much for your love. We bless your holy name. You are so amazing, Father God. I love you so much. We love you. And please come and teach us now and we bless your name in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Okay, guys. So... 
We are on Hosea chapter one. This, have, who, who's gone through Hosea? Have you guys read Hosea yet? Do you know the prophecies of it? If not, I'm gonna, you will probably want your Blue Letter Bible. Um, there's gonna be some things that are gonna be just amazing to you in here. This is a prophetic picture to the northern tribes of Israel. Are you all familiar with, hi, Alicia, shalom. And the pray, yeah, Father God, please heal Alicia of all of her, all the things she needs help with right now. Father God, please help her in the name of Yeshua. Um, please pray for my grandson, is two tomorrow, he has no energy. Oh no, by nightfall, maybe teeth, no more sin. Oh my goodness. Father God, please heal the little boy right now. Reach down and touch him and help him to awaken and be filled with life, vigor, and health. In the name of Yeshua, we ask according to your will. Amen. Um, hey, hey. Hi, Shelby. Okay, so guys, we're in Hosea chapter 1. <clears throat> I need to preface this book. So are you all familiar with the two houses of Israel? If you read the, through First Kings in particular, well, and actually go before that, the very first king of Israel, I'm going to do my little hand things I like to do, is Saul. Saul had a united kingdom. All of Israel was ruled by Saul. Then um, Saul lost the kingdom, okay? And David, and, and actually there was a little bit of a split at Saul's time because Judah started following David and Israel was following Saul because there started to be, David was anointed as the next king because Saul rejected God and tried to serve God in his own way. And God said, nope, obedience is better than sacrifice. <clears throat> so Saul got rejected. David became the next king and David unified both houses of Israel again after this division. So then after David, his son Solomon was wicked and took many, he was wise and good, and then he turned wicked and he had many pagan wives. Because of that, God sent a prophet to him and said, I'm going to take 10 tribes from you and give them to your adversary, who was Jeroboam from the tribe of Ephraim. Okay, so then after Solomon, his son Rehoboam um, was the one who lost the 10 northern tribes. So God had told through the prophet, hey, Solomon, it's not going to happen in your days that I take the 10 tribes from you of the 12. Remember, there's 12 tribes, 13 technically, but I won't confuse you. Joseph has two portions. So the prophet tells Solomon, your son is going to lose 10 tribes. And so, of course, in the days of Rehoboam, Shalom, Larissa, how have you been? So in the days of Rehoboam, the 10 northern tribes started to follow Jeroboam, okay? Jeroboam was from the tribe of Ephraim. He became the leader, the very first leader of the 10 northern tribes of Israel. When you begin reading at this point then in scripture, from that point out, you will notice the divided kingdom. So the 10 northern tribes, of which zero were good kings. <laughs> and then you have the southern kingdom of Judah, Benjamin, and Levi. Levi technically doesn't count. So when it, when they, you know, there's 13 tribes, but there's technically 12, correct? Okay, so there's 12 tribes, 10 were given to the northern kingdom, or to Jeroboam. And then you had these two tribes who remained. See, Levi doesn't get a portion in land. So Levi kind of, which was my family. My family were Kohen. My family were K-O-H-E-N. And so that was the last name of through my grandmother's side and so when they don't really count i mean they do count as a tribe and they do but they don't have any portion of land okay so anyway so then the house of david began um, from the tribe of judah continued to rule over the southern kingdom of israel judah benjamin and levi they became known as the jews the northern kingdom became known as ephraim israel or Joseph, okay? So then we have from here on out the saga of the, the two kingdoms. The southern kingdom has quite a few kings. Hi, Faith. Sorry, I should have tagged people, but of course I forget to tag people. I know there's like 30 of you who aren't tagged and I keep forgetting, I'm so sorry. So anyway, <clears throat> the, the southern kingdom had a series of good kings and bad kings. They would often be good and then bad. So when we read the book of Hosea, the, the, what we have to remember is this is not to both houses of Israel. The prophet Hosea was sent to the northern tribes of Israel. And after the, so in 730 BC, approximately 730 BC, the 10 northern tribes were carried away. This book is the prophecy of that. 
this book is telling about that. Where are we at? So Faith, we are in, we're going to read Hosea. That was Danielle's suggestion tonight. So we're going to go through the book of Hosea. If you are just joining us um, last night and previously in the week, we went through 1 Corinthians. And I believe actually we went, we started that last week. And we go through, we've been going through New Testament books to show how they uphold and validate the Torah. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, we have shown that 1 Corinthians, Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians to obey the law. We showed last week in the book of Romans where Paul said we must obey the law. And so we're trying to go through these chapters to give people the tools to share. Because a lot of people are just coming to Torah right now. There's like this third awakening. It's funny. The first awakening was around the year 2000. The second awakening was around the year 212 beyond and just past that. And then this third awakening is, whew, it's huge. Um, and so it's, it's, yeah. Anyway, we just want to equip you guys. So you have scripture, not man-made teachings and, and other, anything else. These are, this is to help you. So we already prayed. Let's begin. The word of Yahweh that came to Hosea, the son of Berai, in the days of Uzziah, Yotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Listen. And in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. I bet that very line right there, so many of you have skipped over. <laughs> you didn't even notice. Oh, in the days of the kings of Judah and the kings of Israel. So that it's a very prominent theme now that you're not going to be able to miss. I do want to remind you guys, and we've talked about this a lot, in Jeremiah 31, it says the new covenant, the renewed covenant, will be with the house of Judah and the house of Israel. And that's an also, you know, um, Hebrews chapter 8 and chapter 10. And so just remember, there's always this promise and this covenant remaining to God's blood Israelites. But if you were like Caleb, a Kenazite who was a Gentile, or you're like Ruth, you get grafted in. You just become an Israelite. Okay, what Bible version are you reading from? We read from the New King James Version Bible. Okay, so let's, we're on verse two. When Yahweh began to speak by Hosea, Yahweh said to Hosea, go take yourself a wife of harlotry. So he's literally commanded to go take a harlot. Not an easy thing, right? Joe, you would know that, right? <laughs> And that's not going to be good for a man if you know your wife's a harlot. And children of harlotry, for the land has committed great harlotry by, deport, by departing from Yahweh. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. Then Yahweh said to him, call his name Jezreel, for in a little while, which means Yahweh sows. For in a little while, I will avenge the bloodshed of Jezreel on the house of Jehu. Okay, jumping into the book of Hosea, if we have not read what Jehu did back in the book of Kings, we would be confused because we're like, well, what the world did Jehu do? So Jehu was told to kill the house of Ahab and Jezebel, and he did so, but he also killed the king of Judah. So he came against Jezebel and Ahab who were from the kingdom of Israel. And then he came against, <laughs> hi, Isabel. <laughs> and then he came, he also killed um, Jehoram. I believe that was the name of the king right there. Sorry, I'm just not looking. But he then he came against also the king of Judah. And I don't believe he was supposed to do that because I think that's why he's in trouble here. Because it does say God came to Jehu then through the prophet and said, look, Thank you for killing Ahab. Thank you for killing Jezebel to four generations. You know, for four generations, your family will reign because you have kept my word to do this thing. Hi, Mary. We missed you. Hi, Marina. Sorry, we just started. We're in Hosea chapter one. Um, I should have tagged everybody, but again, I forget. I forgot. I'm so sorry. I'll try to tag everybody tomorrow. I just totally forgot. Okay, so Jehu killed in the in this valley of Jezreel is where he did this bloodbath. He was supposed to kill Jezebel. He was supposed to kill the house of Ahab, but he did it with an impure heart. It literally says that Jehu was not careful to walk in the laws of Yahweh. So he obeyed, but with a with almost like a self-centered heart. He did was not careful to continue in the commandments of God. And that's what I think I want to stop right there on that point. When you come to Torah, do not be a Jehu. <laughs> okay, which is actually Yahu. But let me point out the reason why. 
You can obey Torah. You can come against all of the Jezebels in the modern church systems. But if you yourself do not have a heart that is completely devotedly in love with God and you do not submit yourself to Father and you don't wholeheartedly with submission and humility and, and joy of heart serve him and obey his commandments, what you did becomes, <laughs> yes, it, God wanted you to come against those people in the church as far as, as far as not come against them. He wanted to, you to share with them and come against that demonic spirit of Jezebel in the church. But then you yourself are going to get punished. You yourself are going to fall. You yourself are going to find yourself in, in, in dire straits. Because if your heart's not loyal, then you're not much better than the people you just were sent to, quote, judge or share the word of God with. So it is extremely important that to not be a Jehu. Because and, and just Google his name, you'll find it. He was not careful to walk in the ways of the Lord. Now, he still got blessed. But I feel like I see that a lot in the Torah movement, especially having been in it for 22 years now. When, when I'm in the, I see so many people, they, they rise up and they judge mentally and arrogantly, like self-righteously, like, oh my gosh, how could you guys do this? Forgetting like one season ago they were doing it. They say it in such a condemning way, in a mean way, versus like, wow, God, I really love you. I want your people to know you. <laughs> like, hey, I'll help you get your people to you. Like, that's the heart we're supposed to have. We're not supposed to say, I gotta be king of Israel now. I gotta be the king. I'm gonna go judge these people who are doing wicked. Because we forget that we were just that person, well, 20, 23 years ago for me, 20, however many years ago for you guys, right? So when we have a love for God, when we execute his judgments, we do it in a fear and a spirit for him. We do it for his glory, for his honor, for his name. We never do it for ourselves, okay? We do not do it, but that's what Jehu did. Jehu did it for his own self, to justify himself, to establish himself, to put down any rivals around him, and he just wasn't careful. And I don't wanna be that person, and I pray none of us are that person. So that's a little caveat, that verse. So, so here's what Yahweh says. I'm going to read that again. Call his name Jezreel, this child. For in a little while, I will avenge the bloodshed of Jezreel on the house of Jehu and bring an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. An end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. Listen, he's going to end that kingdom. Ten northern tribes. It shall come to pass in that day that I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. And she conceived again and bore a daughter. Then Elohim said to him, call her name Lo Ruchama, which means no mercy. For I will no longer have mercy on the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. But listen, yet I will have mercy on the house of Judah. Why did God have mercy on the house of Judah? Because nearly every other alternate king in the lineage of Judah, every single one of them, or every other one, hi Tara, shalom, Every single one, I keep saying every single one, I meant every other single one, obeyed God. And his obedience is better than sacrifice. God is more angry. He talks about it through scripture. He was more angry at Israel than Judah, which is why Judah got to keep their identity because Judah kept the Torah. It was better in God's eyes to keep the Torah even though they still got in trouble for doing the Talmud and adding extra laws, it was better to him that at least they were trying to obey than that they not try at all and mix them with pagan Gentile ways. That is why the Jews, Judah, has always kept their identity because they were blessed with that because they did, on some level, stay faithful to the covenant. Not completely. Because remember, both houses, it says, um, Ephraim is my helmet. Now you're going to understand that. The 10 northern tribes ruled by the tribe of Ephraim from the first king. Ephraim is my helmet. That's the helmet of salvation. Understanding Yeshua is our salvation. Judah is my lawgiver. The Jews are the ones who hold that scepter of the Torah. So both houses must come together as one stick in his hand. Okay, let me make sure I don't have any. Oh, perfect. Let's talk about the dreams here a little later, sweetie. That'd be great. Exactly. Exactly, Danielle. It's um, how, Saul, how Saul did that. Okay, I'm back. I don't know. Oh, uh, are you talking about when we lost the internet for a minute there, Alicia? I'm so sorry, sweetie. Yeah, it kind of went down. Shalom, Nelly. Hey, girl. I know it's late for you there, but we're going to keep going. Okay. 
Okay, so listen again. I and we're in Hosea tonight, guys. Hi, Pamela. I am so sorry, girls. I totally forgot to tag everybody. I'm so terrible about that. We are reading in the book of Hosea. We are still in chapter one. We're talking about how this book addresses the 10 northern tribes of Israel. Hi, Rita. Shalom, shalom, shalom. Yes, we're in the book of Hosea. It's talking to the 10 northern tribes of Israel. Um, there are two houses of Israel. I think a lot of you, you've been going through the podcast. A lot of you have already been listening to these studies. You know, but if you don't, please don't hesitate. Just remember to message me, contact me, Danielle. Ding, 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 Danielle. Can you link the podcast again? Or Angela, either one of you. Shalom, Kathy, shalom. Okay, so guys, I'm going to start back in verse 6. And she conceived again and bore a daughter. Then Elohim said to him, call her name Lo Ruchama, for I will no longer have mercy on the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. Yet I will have mercy on the house of Judah. Two different houses. The Jews are the ones who are there right now. The, well, my family was Jewish. So, so the Jews kept their identity will save them by the hand of Yahweh their Elohim and will not save them by bow nor by sword or battle by horses or horsemen. And what this prophecy is concerning is Hezekiah. Because when the king of Assyria came down and Hezekiah was the king of Israel of Judah at the time, he didn't get to come near. Yahweh turned that guy right around. Okay, we'll keep going. Now, when she had lean, weaned Lo Ruhama, she conceived and bore a son. Then Elohim said, call his name Lo Ami. Lo is the word not, Ami is my people. Not my people. For you are not my people and I will not be your God. Can you understand or think of a more horrible thing to hear from God? To, for him to say, you are not my people. Like, you are my people, but you're not my people. This is basically the divorce certificate being talked about. However, listen to this. Because remember, this does not have verses. This does not have segments. This is a, this is a whole passage here. The, the translators divided it up, but we would continue reading. Call his name Loami, for you are not my people, and I will not be your God. Yet, however, <laughs> the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people. There it shall be said to them, you are sons of the living Elohim. Then the children of Judah and the children of Israel shall be gathered together and appoint for themselves one head. Okay, girls. Hi, D. Shalom. Shabbat shalom. Who is, I'm sorry, Joe. There's not just girls here. Who is that head? Who is the head? Who is the head? Okay, when the children of Judah and the children of Israel come together, who is the one head they are appointing? Who is it, guys? Hi, guys. I'm just going to wait for you to answer. Who is the one head they appoint? Thank you, Danielle, for listing that. Listing that. Who's the one head? That's awesome, Mary. I have another lady who does that, too. Another friend of mine, she goes, I listen to your podcast. Or, well, not mine. It's whatever. God just has me do it. She listens, she goes to sleep, and I'm like, am I that boring? But I know that's not what she means, and I know that's not what you mean. Um, but maybe I am anyway. Who cares? It's not about me. Okay, who is the one head? Yes. Good job, Mary. Good job. I can't tell if Angela did or not. No, that's great that you did. So the one head they are going to point to for themselves is Messiah. So this is like now, in the last 20 years, more Jews than ever have accepted Yeshua as the Messiah and more Christians than ever have accepted the law-abiding, Torah-obedient Yeshua HaMashiach, right? Isn't that beautiful? That's beautiful. Okay, well, I'm glad you're learning Spanish, Isabel. Oh, wonderful. Okay, you know what, Alicia? If you have questions, sweetie, you just let me know. You, we can talk privately again. I do phone conversations with people all the time, okay? So don't feel bad. Okay, let's keep going, guys. Okay, so the one head they appoint for themselves, this is when Judah and Israel comes together as one head. In the Bible, or in colloquial speech, you often hear Jews and Gentiles. Do you remember the verse in Genesis chapter 48, verse 16, where it said when Jacob crossed his hands and he blessed Ephraim and, and, and Manasseh, and he prophesied that they would become the Milo Hagoim, the fullness of the Gentiles. Do you know that many of these 10 northern tribes of Israel that we're talking to right here, this is the, this is the prophecy telling them or confirming what Jacob had already prophesied over them, that they were going to go to the nations and to the Gentiles. And this is like when the prophet's saying, okay, this is about time where you're going to get kicked out. But he tells them, 
And God tells them, even though I'm going to kick you out and you're not going to be my people anymore, I am going to bring you back. Does God's promise always stand? If God says he's going to do something, does he do it? You better believe it. And he says, in that place where they were said they will not be his people, again it will be. And that is what you guys have been witnessing. And it started about 30 years ago. 20 years ago, it really really ramped up, okay? Exactly, he can't lie. So 20 years ago in the year 2000, that was exactly about 2,730 years after the, the um, scattering, which was the prophesied time by Ezekiel, when you take him laying on his side for 390 times seven for them to awaken. That was the first one, that was the woman. That, um, that's what the father told me, it was the woman. And then around the year 2012, the daughter started arising, the, the child of this woman. It's kind of interesting how it's all happening. Okay, I just want to point that out there, that it is happening. It will happen. His promises remain and never have the 10 Northern tribes come back yet. In fact, at the Western Wall to this day, if you go get a Sidur book and you're there praying with the Jews, they will pray for the 10 tribes to return. Has it happened yet? Has it? Okay, but it's going to, and it is, we are awakening. Okay, so they shall appoint for themselves one head, which is, and they shall come up out of the land, for great will be the day of Jezreel. Say to your brethren, my people, and to your sisters, mercy is shown. So where it was judgment, now it's the, uh, the converse. And guys, please ask if, you, if I'm losing you. Chapter 2, verse 2. Bring charges against your mother, bring charges. For she is not my wife, nor am I her husband. Let her put away her harlotries from her sight and her adulteries from between her breasts, lest I strip her naked and expose her as in the day she was born and make her like a wilderness and set her like a dry land and slay her with thirst. That's not very kind. <laughs> he was mad. <laughs> Yahweh was mad. I will not have mercy on her children for they are the children of harlotry for their mother has played the harlot. Here's where we start to see the symbology of the mother being Israel. Not this. This is not the first place. It's, it's been earlier in scripture. But in this book, when we see the word mother, if you have a dream sometimes of a mother, often your mother will represent Israel and i.e. the Christian church where you were birthed. Okay, so there's a question. What book are we reading? Hosea. Hi, Tanya. I'm sorry. So Hosea chapter two. I'll give you a minute here. Um, well, I guess I'll keep reading. You can catch up. That's We're in Hosea chapter two. Okay, so I will not have mercy. Okay, slave or thirst. I will not have mercy on her children, for they are the children of harlotry, for their mother has played the harlot. So, you know, in the book of Revelation, we, t we see also the great harlot being judged and her daughters. Well, that is the Catholic Church and her Protestant daughters. So, this theme of the mother and the daughter being Israel, i.e., the church, <laughs> because they became many of the Christians as they went through the European nations and they became the modern day Christians. That permeates through the whole of scripture. So just remember that as you read scripture from now on. She who conceived them has behaved shamefully, for she said, I will go after my lovers who give me my bread and my water, my wool and my linen, my oil and my drink. What does that mean? She was literally chasing the things of the world, the pleasures, the, the um, finer things in life. She was chasing other lovers, whereas she was supposed to be faithful to God and say, Father God, you are the one who gives me these things. But she began to commit harlotry. And how do you commit harlotry? You cheat on your spouse. And as you understand the Hebrew culture, you will understand that the marriage, that the covenants given at Mount Sinai, the covenants given to the children of Israel were the ketubah, the marriage proposal, the marriage agreement. Because God's like, look, at Passover, I already saved you from eternal damnation if you put the blood of, you know, on the doorpost and the lintel. That's your salvation. That's your faith in Yeshua, that you were a sinner. You needed protection from this or you're going to hell. You can't do it without his blood. If you remained in Egypt, you perished in Egypt. If, however, you left Egypt, which was symbolic of sin, then you went through the, quote, Red Sea, the Sea of Reeds, and you were, quote, baptized, which is a symbol of getting immersed in the spirit and the water and the word of God. And then you went to the mountain, at the mountain, where God is, here's where God says, now, if you want to be my wife, if you want to be mine, here's what you must do. I've already saved you. But if you want to be my wife, not just a concubine, not just a virgin, not just somebody who, who's just like a servant, if you want to be mine, here is the agreement. Agree to it. It's kind of like a prenuptial, but in Hebrew it's called katuba, <laughs> a katuba. And so she broke his commandments. If you break 
<laughs> let me put it this way. Satan had all these rules over here of the flesh. God had all these rules of his ways of kindness. If you leave God's rules and you go over here with Satan and do his ways of sin, you are cheating on your father, your husband, your God, <laughs> right? Because he has, he has this set of rules for you. And this is if you love him, you will do this, his, his Torah, his laws. When you leave that and you go do Satan's ways, it's like being intimate with Satan. Okay, I'm gonna say that because I know we have children listening right now. It's like being intimate with Satan. We're not supposed to be friends or intimate with Satan. And so that's how these children were a harlot, okay? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to comment and only listen from Isabel. Okay, sweet girl. Yes, disobedience, exactly. So that is what it's talking about here. It's like, so they were, they committed harlotry with the husband who was perverse in his ways. And so then you got to think about, okay, so what, and it doesn't say exactly what they were doing, but she said, look, you're going to, I'm going to go after my lovers who give me bread and water, wool, linen, oil, and drink. And those things, whatever they were doing, had to have been contrary to Torah, right? I mean, they were contrary to God's ways. And so my thinking in that, sometimes we think about modern society, just so people can relate to this. So you're like, okay, I'm gonna go after my lovers who give me my bread and water. Well, let's say we take a job and we break Sabbath for that job. Like we, right? We break Sabbath so we can make money. Boom, we cheated on God for this pagan God of money in violation of his Sabbath. Let's say we take a job where we're serving people pork and shellfish. We're literally serving them sin. I, you know, how could you be a waitress? How could you work at a grocery store and check people out or serve them food, which you know is, right? So for money, you're gonna violate your God. So I always apply this. The reason I do this, guys, is so we can apply it to our life and help us to not do these same mistakes, right? We're supposed to learn from this. Like, we can't do this. I can't sell on the Sabbath. I can't give you pork. I can't work at a store and sell you GMOs or pork or something unclean. H how could my conscience answer to my God? I am faithful and loyal to him. He will provide me opportunity to never violate his ways. He is my provider. I don't need this person over here who is contrary to God. I don't need that job. I'm never, <laughs> I don't need that job. God will provide me a job that will be that where I can be obedient. And I promise you that's the case. And in my own our life, I, I've shared with you guys examples of it. Does that make sense, guys? What I'm trying to make you re realize and how you can relate this to yourselves and not commit the same sins of the forefathers? Okay, good. There's a thumbs up. So let's not go after our lovers. Let's stay faithful to God because he will always take care of our needs. So there, for behold, I will hedge up your way with thorns and wall her in so that she cannot find her paths. She will chase her lovers, but not overtake them. Yes, she will seek them, but not find them. Then she will say, so then it's gonna be hard. I, I, who knows what happened to this person? Israel, I get it. You know, they were committing adulterous ways. A lot of these northern tribes of Israel, some of them were up seafarers, right? They worked with Tyre. You can read about that in um, Jeremiah where it talks about the different things they traded. Who knows what they were doing specifically? I'm just relating it to our life. But then this, this avenue of adultery isn't working anymore to pay her bills. Like let's say we're working for a job that breaks Sabbath or we're in debt and bound up with things we're not supposed to be. And then she says, I'm gonna go and return to my first husband. For then it was better for me than now. For she did not know that I gave her grain, new wine, and oil, and multiplied her silver and gold, which they prepared for Baal. So when you're faithful to God, it's it's not always easy, but he provides everything you need. And, and God's like, gosh, they didn't even see what they didn't even see what I was doing for them. And they started chasing all these horrible things of Satan or the adver the reason I use the word Satan is because he means adversary. It's the, the one opposite God, basically, right? Anything, any, a lot of people are Satan's, actually, if you wanted to know the Hebrew word, Hasatan, it's the adversary. And then when those things don't work out, then they want to come back. Think about the story of the prodigal son. I'm going to stop here for a minute. You guys know how we do this. In the story of the prodigal son, you have the father. And then you have the son who wants to take his inheritance and go, and he ends up feeding swine. But one son stays with him. Now, wait a minute. Didn't we just talk about two, the number two, and two different bodies in the, in, amongst the children of Israel. Hmm, so who would be the son that stayed by the father, that stayed loyal and kept the commandments of God? I'm not saying they did it perfectly. They did add in the Talmud, but we're told they offended less than Israel. That was Judah. 
Judah is the son in the prodigal story. In the story, in the Judah is the son in the story of the prodigal son, the son that stayed by the father, the son that went away and was working amongst the swine, are of course the Christians, because Christians are the ones who eat the unclean things. They eat the swine. They love swine. I mean, my goodness, every. Exter, I don't even like saying the word Easter, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> Every one of those pagan dinners, they got that ham right there. <laughs> and that's not good. And so they are the ones who left the father. And the father didn't leave. Remember, the father didn't leave chasing that. They had to come back. And so as Ephraim is returning, in this passage where we're saying, she's like, ooh, it was better for me. Just like the prodigal son. What does the prodigal son say? Oh my goodness, it was better for me with my father. Oh, I, I'm so glad you understand that, Alicia. I think all of us have had that prodigal son moment, huh? I just switched from cell phone to my tablet. I see better. Good. Okay, great, Pamela. My husband buys more pork now than ever since I told him what it really is. And that's actually what will often happen, Mary. As you stand up for Yahweh's truth, the spirit the fl will work so much on their flesh. But you just stay firm, loving and kind, never compromise. Don't buy it for him. Don't cook it for him. You stay faithful to Yahweh, and that is what will convict them. And yes, they do. I've been mocked for giving up pork, but isn't that crazy? It's crazy. Like, I'll tell you what, Jesus' big victory on a cross was not that you can eat a ham sandwich. <laughs> like, that was not his big victory. Woohoo! Those Jews didn't know. God didn't know what he was doing, right? That's so, that's so crazy. Exactly. It is rebellion, Joe. Okay. I hope that makes sense. The stories make sense. I tried to tie in so now you can share the story of the prodigal son with, your, with, with the people you're sharing with. Please, I'm passing the ball to you. Be in your court. You make sure you're sharing that word out there. Okay. So, the, okay, I'm going to continue in verse eight here. For she did not know that I gave her grain, new wine and oil, and multiplied her silver and gold, which they prepared for Baal. The word Baal is actually the same word you use for a husband in Hebrew, Baali. Um, that means my husband, Baali. But it means Lord. And so it was the name, like of what they would often call these other things like lords or sovereigns over them. But interesting, it's the same word that's often used as husband because your husband is supposed to be your Lord over you. He is supposed to be kind of the ruler over you. It's interesting. It's just kind of a generic name for the pagan gods. Therefore, I will return and take away my grain in its time and my new wine in its season and will take back my wool and my linen given to cover her nakedness. Now I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers and no one shall deliver her from my hand. I bet any of us and all of us in our moments of prodigal sunness, <laughs> If that's a word. The people that we were chasing are actually the ones who turned against us and God shamed us in front of them. Um, we don't eat pork. It makes my husband... Eat. Right. Please don't eat pork. Thank you, Libby. We just thank God. Thank God you saw that. Thank you, Yahweh. We are not to eat pork. Yeshua will destroy those eating pork when he returns. Isaiah 65 says it. Isaiah 66 says it. So I think it's Isaiah 65 verse 17 and Isaiah 66 verse 5. Okay, so we want to stay away from the piggy piggy because we don't want to be destroyed when he returns. We want to make him happy, not unhappy. So he's going to take those things away and he's going to uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers and no one shall deliver her from my hand. Uh, listen, listen please to this. I will also cause all her mirth, her joy to cease. Her feast days, her new moons, her Sabbaths, all her appointed feasts. What did we talk about last night? What did we talk about last night? Hi, Sherry. Do you guys remember what we talked about? Oh, I, or was it last week? <laughs> it was last week. It was Saturday. The reason we do not make replacement ceremonies is because the Father took them away from us. Now, the ones you are to do in all of your dwellings, yes, you are to do. But Passover, Deuteronomy 16 says you can only do that in the gates of Jerusalem. God took it away from us because we were wicked. And in fact, one of the sins of Jeroboam is that many of the people wanted to go to Jerusalem to keep the feast as was prescribed. So Jeroboam made feasts like that in a different month. He said, so they, he said it was a political move, so they would not go and defect to the king of Judah. Never stand in the way of God and his people. Let them obey, <laughs> right? Which is the, the Christian pastors need to hear that and sort of the messianic rabbis. They need to hear that. Don't stand in the way of God and his people. Let his people go. Let them worship him. Okay. Um, thank you. My husband suffers from gout. Okay. Okay. So okay, you guys are just talking about that. Great job. You guys keep answering each other. So God causes her feast days, her new moons, her Sabbaths, and all her appointed feasts to stop. So if God sent us to time out and he took away those beautiful things from us, we don't really get to shove his hand aside and say, 
you know what? I'm doing it anyway. We now are in the period of mourning, repenting, and turning back to the Father. We are the ones crying out, saying, oh my goodness, Father God, we realize the sins of our fathers. Please forgive us. We have continued in their ways. Please accept us, restore us, forgive us. Come back, Yeshua HaMashiach. Come back to us, Yahweh Elohim. Come back to the place where your feet reside. Come back, build that third temple that Ezekiel says. Please, Messiah, please, Yahweh, please come back to us. That is what our hearts should be. Zephaniah 3.18 says, those who mourn, for the feasts shall return. Well, there's a morning when you realize that our sin caused him to spurn his temple and leave. He didn't leave the temple because Jesus rose from the dead. 70 AD is when the temple was destroyed. 40 years after Yeshua rose from the dead, it was because we were wicked. Our sin pushed him away. He says it in Lamentations. He says it here. He says it other places. I never knew in temple. Okay, yeah. Okay. Verse 12, and I will destroy her vines and her fig trees of which she has said, these are my wages that my lovers has, have given me. So I will take them, I'm sorry, so I will make them a forest and the beasts of the field shall eat them. I will punish her for the days of the bales to which she burned incense. She decked herself with her earrings and jewelry and went after her lovers, but me she forgot, says Yahweh. Ah, that breaks my heart. I hate, I hate that, I hate that. I don't wanna go after anything other than my God. Nothing. Please, guys, let's make sure we don't go after anything. Let's not chase Christmas or Easter or, or idolatrous ways or fame from the world. Let's not chase anything but Yahweh. I accidentally ate some within the second of stuffing it. Oh, I'm so sorry, Angela. Therefore, behold, I will allure her, will bring her into the wilderness. Oh my gosh, this is how good our God is, how merciful. You guys, you don't have a right to divorce somebody, give up on somebody, or walk away from somebody who's nasted you after all our God has done for us. Look at, he's like, you were an adulteress to me. You cheated on me. You were a harlot. You went after your other lovers. But I am going to allure her. He's like, look, I'm finding ways to draw her back to me. Constantly, despite our sin, he is finding ways trying to pull us back to him. Trying to pull us back. I am not saying to go ahead and head and shake hands with the devil. I am not saying to, to sit with Goliath and eat. I am saying, who are you to hold a grudge? Who are we to hold a grudge against anybody? If we do not forgive, we will not be forgiven. That is scripture. That is Messiah's own words. So he, after all we've done to him, he's going to lure us into the wilderness. Huh? You know how a lot of you feel alone? Do you know how a lot of you feel alone when you come back to Torah? Remember what we talked about, Ezekiel chapter 20? He is going to take every single one of his children to the wilderness, and there he will make them pass under the rod of the covenant. And if they come into under the rod, if they come into obedience of his Torah, they get to go into the promised land. You guys, stay faithful, humble yourselves, stay away from the yucky stuff, come right into obedience of God. You will get to go to the promised land. Some of us might have to die first. There are martyrs. Who knows who's going to be called to give their life first during this tribulation. But either way, he says he's going to allure us. Right here, he's going to allure us to the wilderness. It's the same thing Ezekiel 20 says. He's going to draw us into the wilderness. We are going to be made to pass under the law, the rod, I'm sorry, come into bondage, come into the covenant again. I'm sorry, not bondage. And if we don't, if we reject the Torah, it says we don't get to enter the promised land. Now, guys, the promised land is the whole goal of our whole spiritual walk. The promised land is a picture of coming to that place and that rest under the shalom of Yeshua. The whole word Jerusalem, Yerushalayim, is based upon the word shalom, Yahweh shalom, his peace. So if we don't get to the promised land, because where are we told in the book of Isaiah, our peace is found in obedience to him. Does that make sense? If we don't continue, if we don't come under the rod of the, uh, and, and into that covenant again with him, if we don't accept that, then we don't get to go to the promise and we never are going to see the peace of God because there is no peace for the wicked. And the wicked are those who transgress the commandments of God. Doesn't that make sense, guys? We don't want to break this off. Do you see how the whole Bible goes together? You cannot just read one section and not the rest. This is, matches with Ezekiel 20, matches with Isaiah. It all goes together. Okay, did I miss some questions? Oh, I had to put on my headphones. My husband put on TV so loud I couldn't hear. <laughs> yes, honestly, Pamela, it's a spiritual battle. There, there's a lot of things like that. Praise Yahweh. I'm glad you guys are all giving up the picky pig. I should have known years ago when my daughter's, oh, wow. Praise God that like, you guys are definitely Israelites, huh? Oh, Kimberly, of course. So Kimberly, here's the thing. We've been talking about this and you might have just 
was last night your first podcast or your first live with us? I can't remember. Here's the thing. Yahweh does not want you saved from a Babylonian religion just to go to another religion. And what I tell people, I'm so sad for this generation of you guys coming to Torah because it's so easy for you to get on the internet and get on YouTube and do all these things. And you forget, like we had to do 20 and 30 years ago, we just went and sat at his feet. <laughs> I didn't have an internet to go to. So we had to hear his voice. We had to press in. And we knew, we were told, you know the scriptures. So when you know Genesis through Deuteronomy, if you know it like the back of your hand in Hebrew and in English and everything you study it, you will identify his voice and not his voice. Because especially when you understand the spirit of it, which the Holy Spirit helps you to do. You cannot just run following people. You can't follow Melissa. You can't follow Danielle. You can't follow Morgan. You can't follow this person, that person. You are to follow Yeshua. So when he calls you, he's like, hey, 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 Kimberly, come sit with me. Come sit at my feet, sweetie. I want to teach you. But when you first, let me find a teaching on this matter. We get on YouTube. We find a teaching. We listen to somebody. We didn't, boom, that voice made it hard sometimes to hear God's voice. Now, true teachers are your teachers behind you, it says. They're, God will reveal to you who your teachers are, okay? The book of Isaiah says that. So there are teachers. There are people that God... So I'm not saying you're not supposed to be... That, I mean, uh, duh, he made me a teacher. He told me I was a teacher. He, in 2004, he told me because I was like, <laughs> I'm so afraid to teach people like because I don't want to be wrong. In 2004, he gave me the dream and I kept putting my children on the bus and like, I'll see you at the end. <laughs> that was literally the dream. He goes, Mel, and I woke up, he says, Mel, they actually need, they don't hear my voice like you do. You need to teach them. And I was like, <gasps> okay, just make me never say something wrong. Make me never say something wrong. Yeah, I shut my mouth. Like, I literally want to choke before I could say something wrong. Like, you know, Daniel knows me. Morgan knows me. I like, I will pray. Like, you stop me. Put a freight train in front of me. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't want to speak wrong because it's scary. And that's what your teachers should be. Your teachers should be so afraid to speak wrong that they don't just speak their own poopy stuff out of their butt. We want to speak Yahweh's words and only his truth. And our job is to turn you to God. We're not supposed to stand between you and God. I'm not supposed to tell you, hey, just come to me for all the answers. I'm supposed to say, hey, Kimberly, God loves you. He wants you to be intimate with him. He wants you to yada him, to know him. That's the word for Hebrew to yada is to be intimate. It's the, symbol, it's the right hand. He wants to know you just like he knows me, Like right? He wants you to know him, sit with him. So let him speak to you where you're supposed to be. When he told me to make the podcast, um, I think, right, you should go through, the, I think that because it goes chapter by chapter through scripture. That is a safe place because, of course, I'm going to say that, but he's what he told me to make. He told me. So go listen to the podcast, do these lives where we literally just go through scripture. But be careful of certain things. Like I know Father always would twinge me and, and tell me to stay away from things of certain teachings. And YouTube is and the internet, it makes it so dangerous for you guys because you're so afraid. And, and I'm sorry, I was, a, I was a teacher, you know that. You guys have been taught the instant gratification. You don't even know what it's like to wait for the voice of the Lord or wait for the Lord. Remember how Daniel had to wait 10, 21 days? Daniel, like one of the most beloved men of all time. He didn't have in three seconds the answer from Siri. Does that make sense, guys? You need, to learn, you need to learn the art of patience and waiting for the Lord. You need to learn the art of waiting for his answers, not being so impatient that you need to know right now. Because you are sometimes going to miss the lessons in the waiting if you do that, if you push through it too fast. And so my suggestion is always, if the Father told you and put on your heart that you need to listen to something, listen and obey, okay? But you need to get in Scripture you need to get in scripture with him, Genesis to Deuteronomy. Yes, if you have a learning disability, if there's struggles you have, I understand. Please go through the podcast, reach out. I will read with you. I mean, I've, I've the last week, I don't know how many people I've spent two hour sections of time with. Just, I sit there two hours on the phone with them. It's usually about two hours. I'm nothing. I'm here for you. That's what my job is. Just, right? Yahweh told me to do it. So if you need help, please reach out. But know that you must test everything against the word of God, of the Torah. It says in Deuteronomy 13, if somebody takes you away from the Torah, that it's not the, <laughs> it's not the spirit of God. So you need to make sure you know it, that you know his voice, so you'll recognize it. Because like when he told me to stop wearing makeup, I recognized his voice. I knew it was him. There didn't have to be an explicit verse that said not to do it. Because once he told me, I already knew the heart and the spirit of the Torah, not to allure men after myself, not to be vain, not to draw attention to myself. I am to only represent and turn people to Messiah. 
The whole thing of Torah is to teach us humility and righteousness, not how good we are, but how good he is. And that's why we realize how much our Savior, we have a need for a Savior. Does that make sense, guys? Every time you read the Word of God, it should make you more humble, more joyful in him, more thankful to him, and make every move and thought you ever do, everything you ever do, should just bring glory to him, not yourself. That's how you know it's his voice. Okay, it's a long little segue there. Verse 14, we're gonna start there again, chapter two, verse 14. Therefore, behold, I will allure her, will bring her into the wilderness and speak comfort to her. He is so merciful. We better remember that, we better pay it forward. We have no right to bear a grudge and Leviticus 19 says, don't you dare bear a grudge against your brother. I will, and that's anybody. You don't have a right. We don't have a right. We've been wicked. I will give her her vineyards from there and the valley of Accor as a door of hope. She will sing there. Now the valley of Accor was where there was a bad, wasn't that where, off the top of my head, I'm sorry guys, I should have, we didn't prepare because we just decided tonight what we're going to go through. But the valley of Accor, I believe is where they went in the two spies, the 12 spies went in to check out the land, if I remember. Oh, actually, it says right here. Yes, it was. <laughs> that's where Jericho was. I thought that's what I remembered. I just wanted to make sure. As in the days of her youth, as in the days when she came up from the land of Egypt. Oh, that's beautiful. He's going to bring us right back that way. There's a second exodus, and somebody reached out. I can't remember which one of you reached out. Remember, that's Jeremiah 16 and Jeremiah 23. And perhaps that person's not even on here. Let me make sure I'm not missing any questions. I'm so glad you have headphones, Pamela. Um... Let's see. Okay, I'm gonna have, yeah, um, I really need to talk to you. Mary, please reach out, you know, we can talk. Um, oh, I keep cutting out for you, Pamela. I'm so sorry, it's buffering. <gasps> Yummy, please help. <clears throat> the pot. Okay, I'm glad. Hi, Erica, I missed you at first. Um, yeah, YouTube is full of false prophets, exactly. Hey, guys, is it, so some people it's buffering. Let's just keep praying, pray that Father, um, yeah, okay. Um, honey, oh, thank you. Yeah, okay, so I'm just making sure I didn't miss a question there. <clears throat> Father God, please let it just flow smoothly and not, don't let Satan cut it out in the name of Yeshua, for your glory. Okay, so verse 16, and it shall be in that day, says Yahweh, that you will call me my husband and no longer call me my master. So here's the word husband, ishi, it actually just man, husband. And then you're no longer going to call me my master, Ba'ali, Ba'ali. Remember I was saying sometimes you can call your husband Ba'ali, but isn't that interesting? To hear he's saying no more, you're, gonna, you're not going to use that word anymore from me. You're just going to say Ishi. Hey, I'm back. Yesterday was the first time you're alive. I'm like, oh, awesome, Lisa. Shalom, shalom. I'm so sorry if you missed the first part. This will be posted to the page, Yahweh willing. You can go back and listen to it. We're in the book of Hosea. We're in chapter 2. And it shall be in that day, says Yahweh, that you shall call me my husband and no longer call me my master, for I will take from her mouth the name of the Baals. Notice the play on word there. The word my master were, there was the same word Baal. It's the Baal. So it's that same word being used here. He says, you're not going to say that anymore. And they shall be remembered by their name no more. In that day, I will make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field, with the birds of the air, and with the creeping things of the ground. Bow and sword of battle I will shatter from the earth to make them lie down safely. I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice and loving kindness and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness and you shall know Yahweh. It shall come to pass in that day that I will answer, says Yahweh, I will answer the heavens and they shall answer the earth. The earth shall answer with grain, with new wine and with oil. And if often we're, you know, in Israel, we're based on a very agricultural cycle and so Yahweh gives each of the tribes divisions of land. Ezekiel 47 tells us how when Messiah returns how the tribes will divide up the land amongst themselves. We're a very agricultural society. We're supposed to be. We've gotten pushed away from that which I believe is a, a ploy of Satan but when Yahweh gives us the rain for our crops and lets everything grow and and flourish that's his blessing to us. They shall answer Jezreel then I will because it means God sows Yahweh sows and I will sow her for myself in the earth and I will have mercy on her who had not obtained mercy. And then I will say to those who were not my people, you are my people. And they shall say, you are my God. Oh, beautiful. Then Yahweh said to me, we're in chapter three, go again, love a woman who is loved by the lover and is committing adultery. So Hosea's wife, <laughs> 
leaves him and goes and commits adultery. Hi, Winona. I was wondering about you. How you've been? Okay, shalom, shalom. Okay. Go again, love a woman who is loved by a lover and is committing adultery, just like the love of Yahweh for the children of Israel who look to other gods and love the raisin cakes of the pagans. Huh. Remember we had, a, those of you on our thread, there was people talking today about like accepting Christmas presents and stuff. No, no, no. We don't accept the raisin cakes of the pagan gods. No, we don't shake hands with the devil. No, we don't embrace the devil. If anything was for a pagan god, we don't do it. If anything's for a pagan god, we shun it. We are loyal and faithful to our Yahweh who chose to save us in his mercy and grace. Beautiful thing. So I bought her for myself for 15 shkalim. It doesn't say shekels or it's added in of silver. And one and a half omers of barley. And I said to her, you shall stay. This cracks me up. I don't mean this. This I don't know why it makes me laugh because it seems like the way they write it, you know. You shall stay with me many days. Yeah, I think that's probably a nice way of putting it. I think if I had a harlotrous wife, I would be like, if I was a man, I'd be like, yeah, you're not doing this anymore. <laughs> and he was like, you know, you're, you're going to stay with me many days. You shall not play the harlot, nor shall you have a man. So too will I be towards you. For the children of Israel, listen, listen, listen. No Starbucks. I know, right? For the children of Israel, listen, shall abide many days without king or prince, because they were cast out. They don't have the king, of the Right? Without sacrifice or sacred pillar, what did I say? We just read that God took the feasts away from us because of our disobedience and our sin. He's telling us, you're going to be without sacrifice or sacred pillar. That's a punishment. It's not a good thing. So when we have the temples reset up and we see in Ezekiel 45, Yeshua is offering the sacrifices again. Remember, it's because we still keep the Passover every year. We will keep the Passover too as a remembrance. The sacrifices never ever cleansed us. The sacrifices were for teaching of what Messiah did. We are to constantly remember what our God did for us. They're a beautiful thing. Six out of seven of the, well, five out of seven of the sacrifices are dinner with daddy. Anyway, like you literally are thankful. You take one of your choice animals, take it there. They butcher it. They put it on the big barbecue grill. You eat it. You give part to the priest and we eat it. It's a beautiful thing. Exactly. No idolatry. So, but the curse was, a judgment was, they're going to reside without sacrifice or sacred pillar. It was not because Jesus died and rose from the dead. It is because we were wicked, <laughs> like without ephod or teraphim. Afterward, the children of Israel shall return. So that was before we repented and returned. After the children of Israel shall return and seek Yahweh their Elohim and David their king. Does David get resurrected? You guys, I need some interaction here. Who is David there? This is the same David that Ezekiel 45 talks about. Ezekiel 44 talks about. Ezekiel 46 talks about. Who is David? Do you really think it's King David? Who is it? Hopefully it's not buffering too much. Father God, please let it go smoothly. Who is David? Y'all see it? Do you hear me? Hopefully it's still working. Oh, Yeshua, you got it, Daniel. <laughs> I was just making sure because, like, if the internet is acting weird here, I'm so sorry, Father God, please help. I can actually do something that, yes, exactly, exactly, exactly. That's who the King David is. So when you read Ezekiel now, starting in chapter 40 to the end, that David there is this same David. Do you see how you have to know the whole Bible? You cannot parse it apart. Okay. So this is going to be David, our king. They shall fear Yahweh and his goodness in the latter days. This didn't already happen. This is now. This is the latter days. Like our Messiah, we are about to enter the tribulation. We are about to have the hardest time we've ever had. We are about, <laughs> we are about to see our king return. I'm so sorry, guys. I'm like getting sweating to death. I'm like sweating. Okay, perfect. I hope that all makes sense. It's a beautiful thing. This is happening in the latter days. So when do the children of Israel return? When do the 10 northern tribes return? In the latter days. Okay. Chapter four, hear the word of Yahweh, you children of Israel, for Yahweh brings a charge against the inhabitants of the land. There's no truth or mercy or knowledge of God in the land. By swearing and lying, killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break all restraint. 
with bloodshed upon bloodshed. Therefore the land will mourn and everyone who dwells there will waste away. With the beasts of the field and the birds of the air, even the fish of the sea will be taken away. That's pretty intense. It's kind of like the floods, you know, how the animals are even judged. Now let no man contend or rebuke one another for your people are like those who contend with the priest. <laughs> I have never met more arrogant people than in America. They think they can literally talk bad about the president. They think they can run their mouth loosely and talk bad against authorities put in power by God. But we're commanded not to do that. And we're not even to argue with the priests. You're not to argue. Like even Paul, when Paul started to revile the high priest and the high priest said, hey, I'm the high priest. Or somebody said, that's the high priest. He goes, oh, I did not know. Forgive me. Because you're not to do that. How do I throw that pen every night, guys? <clears throat> I threw it last night and I threw it tonight. I think I wiggle it a lot. We just know no reverence in America. We feel like we have this ability and the right to speak whenever we want. I am so glad I was raised with the family I was raised in. <laughs> like, you didn't speak back to an adult because any adult could spank you, paddle you, or backhand you. You just knew respect. My aunts could, can't, so could spank me. My teachers could spank me. Anybody could. And guess what? I never needed to get spanked because I knew it was real. <laughs> like, we need to be a, like have this reverence because I had this like, I was teaching piano lessons to a child and the child had not practiced her lessons that week. And so I was gentle and I said, okay, sweetie, we're gonna do this again for next week. The child pushed me and hit at me and then went to the mom and coddled and the mom coddled her and said, oh, you like, and took her side. Like, and the mom was right there in the room with me. And I was just like, okay, sweetie, we're going to do this again because I can tell you haven't practiced. So let's, let's, you know, let's just take this song again and work on these elements so we can learn it. You guys, if I had done that as a child, I don't think I'd be alive. <laughs> that is not acceptable. And this is what got, like, you can't, you're not, like, how many people would argue with the priest? like 90% of Americans, right? Who knows reverence anymore? Who knows anything about respect? We don't, we just are so loud mouth and we, oh my goodness, it's horrible. It's horrible. This is what God has been talking to me for 20 years. He shows me all the time. He goes, these people just are so, they feel like they have the right to say whatever. They know nothing of how to be deferent. Is that a word? To have deference, yeah. <laughs> okay, for your people are like those who contend with the priest. That's a bad thing. Therefore, you shall stumble in the day. The prophet also shall stumble with you in the night, and I will destroy your mother. Who's the mother? Israel. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you from being priest for me. So this is what we just were told. They're going to reside many days without priests. And, and when you reject his knowledge, then he just he rejects you completely, right? I will also reject you from being priest for me because you have forgotten the law of your God. Oh, so it wasn't the judgment that they were obeying the law of God. The bad thing was that they were doing was disobeying the law of God. They forgot his laws. That was the bad thing. The law was never bad. You have forgotten because you have forgotten the law of your God. Like we're told in Malachi chapter four to remember the law of Moses right here is where we were told you forgot it. You forgot the law of your God. Malachi four says, in, with, it talks about the spirit of Elijah in the coming day of the Lord. It says, um, before the coming and dreadful day of the Lord, I will send you Elijah the prophet. And it says, remember the law of Moses and he shall turn the hearts of the children back to the father and the hearts of the father to the children, right? It's talking about now turning back to Torah obedience. So guys, I want you to know your Bible like this, where you can put all these scriptures together. So I pray that the Father sear his word on all of your hearts so you know it like this, so you can just share like this. Um, we love all of you too. My mom would have busted my butt. Yeah, I am sure my butt more than my butt would have been busted on that one, huh? <laughs> um, because you have, for, I, I sat there shocked because I didn't know what to do and I'm not a confrontational person. I'm not gonna argue with somebody. I was like, I couldn't believe it. And like, I wanted to like discipline the child and say, you don't treat adults like that. But I just knew the Holy Spirit was restraining me because that person's heart wasn't ready for it. But I was like, oh my gosh. Anyway, I also will forget your children. Oh. The more they increased, the more they sinned against me. I will change their glory into shame. They eat up the sin of my people. They set their heart on their iniquity and it shall be like people, like priests. So I will punish because the priests in Dan and Bethel who were 
the head, that's where the head of the 10 northern tribes were. They would go to Dan and Bethel. Those priests were leading them in pagan ways. They were telling them to do the feasts of God in a different way, on a different day, but very similar, it says, to the same ones in Jerusalem. They said they, they didn't have to go to Jerusalem for those feasts. And it says that was the sin of them, people, the sin of Jeroboam in particular. So they were teaching them false ways. Oh, sounds a lot like the Christian church system, doesn't it? Okay, teaching them false ways. So I will punish them for their ways and reward them for their deeds. For they shall eat, but not have enough. They shall commit harlotry, but not increase, because they have ceased obeying Yahweh. Harlotry, wine, and new wine enslave the heart. My people ask counsel from their wooden idols, and their staff informs them. So this is like divination and doing all sorts of crazy things. For the spirit of harlotry has caused them to stray, and they have played the harlot against their Elohim. They offer sacrifices on the mountaintops and burn incense on the hills, under oaks, poplars, and terebinths, because their shade is good. Therefore, your daughters commit harlotry, and your brides commit adultery. I will not... Listen to this. I will not punish your daughters when they commit harlotry. I think there's nothing scarier than when God turns you over. Okay, I say that a lot. There's nothing scarier. Okay, that's one of the most scary things. That's one of the scariest things. He's not even going to punish the daughters anymore. He's like, fine, I'm just going to let you do it. You've ever been there as a parent? <laughs> like where your child pushes you? And you're like, fine, see how your way works out. That's what the God's doing here. He's like, yeah, why don't you see how your way works you know, you rejected my ways, the good ways. Remember, we just read that the other day. What book was that? Now I'm forgetting which. But we just read it the other day that his ways were the good ways. Maybe I made a reel about it instead of the live. Anyway, he's like, just try it. And he sits back with his hands crossed, right? Nor your, okay, so I will not punish your daughters when they commit harlotry, nor your brides when they commit adultery. For the men themselves go apart from, with harlots and offer sacrifices with a ritual harlot. Therefore, people who do not understand will be trampled. Though you, Israel, play the harlot, <clears throat> let not Judah offend. Do not come up to Gilgal, nor go up to Bethaven, nor swear an oath, saying, as Yahweh lives. For Israel is stubborn, like a stubborn calf. Now Yahweh will let them forage like a lamb in open country. So he's like, I will send them away. Okay, I just lost my place. <laughs> Ephraim is joined to idols, let him alone. Their drink is rebellion. They commit harlotry continually. Her, her rulers dearly love dishonor. The wind has wrapped her up in its wings and they shall be ashamed because of their sacrifices. So he's like, he's really upset at Israel for all their harlotry and idolatry. Chapter five. I'm not going through all the little minutia right here of this. Of the, there's so much in the Hebrew we could get into for little things. I want to keep this exactly, Alicia. I want to keep this where we can understand the story on the basic level of the analogy given here. You can purse it apart, but sometimes then you miss the big story. Let's just keep going with the flow. Hear this, O priest. Take heed, O house of Israel. Give hear, O house of the king. For yours is the judgment, because you have been a snare to Mizpah and a net spread in Tabor. The revolters are deeply involved in slaughter, though I rebuke them all. I know Ephraim, and Israel is not hidden from me. For now, O Ephraim, you commit harlotry. Israel is defiled. Now, you should obviously cannot do this Okay, did I miss a question here, Erica? Thank you for... Yes, exactly. Deuteronomy 16 says it can only be done. Let me... Okay, let me pause for a minute and read the... Thank you, Erica, for catching that. I didn't realize there was a question. <laughs> I bet that's little Isabel. Okay, so Nellie, let me... I'm so sorry where I missed your questions. Dis yeah, disrespectful children are part of our curses. You've got it, Angela. That's... Did she address this about Passover? Okay, Tara... Okay, are you saying Passover should... No, okay. And, okay, and if you want more about the feasts, we did that on Saturday, on Sabbath last week, so... Well, it would have been... <laughs> I'm trying to do the math right now. Well, seven days ago, but it's actually eight days ago, right? Because, like, it was last Saturday, and this is now... Well, last Sabbath. I hate to say Saturday, but you know what I mean. On the one that was the adult teaching, we went through all the feasts. We cannot do the Passover till we're in Jerusalem. And so please go listen to that, that teaching. It's on, it's, um, it, I think it says the Feasts of Yahweh on the heading. I think I remembered to title that one. I am so, I forget to do that a lot. But go back and look at that one. I think I remembered to label it. And it'll be under videos and you should be able to go find the date from last Sabbath. 
and it talks about all the feasts. There are some that we're told to do in all of our dwellings, wherever we are, and some of them have specific sacrifices that says we can only do it there, and we get scattered and dispersed. We got scattered and dispersed, and part of our punishment was we lost those, which we've been covering here in the book of Hosea. There's also places, other places that say that as well. Like, anyway, we won't go that right now. Okay, for now, O oh, Ephraim, you commit harlotry, Israel is defiled, verse 4. Chapter 5, verse 4. They do not direct their deeds towards turning to their God, for the spirit of harlotry is in their midst, and they do not know Yahweh. The pride of Israel testifies to his face, therefore Israel and Ephraim stumble in their iniquity. And now, usually a conjunction do joins two separate entities. But in this case, Israel is Ephraim. And it's talking about kind of like in the book of Ezekiel, where it says, take this stick of Israel and, jo and, um, and the tribes of Joseph and his sons, and then it says Judah and Israel. I think it's saying that this part of Israel, okay? So this is identifying the 10 northern tribes of Israel under Ephraim. So therefore Israel and Ephraim stumble in their iniquity. Judah also stumbles with them. Okay, both houses are stumbling. With their flocks and herds, they shall go to seek Yahweh, but they will not find him. He has withdrawn himself from them. They have dealt treacherously with Yahweh, for they have begotten pagan children. Isn't that horrible? The word there is actually strange children. Now a new moon shall devour them and their heritage. Now, let's look. I want to show you here. That's something when you get to a verse like that, you're like, what? What do you mean the new moon is going to devour them? So let's go over here to Hosea and let's go to chapter, we're in chapter five. I want to show you here what that says in the Hebrew. Because if you read it in the Hebrew, it literally, oh, I don't have my Hebrew Bible out right now. And it doesn't have it up here. Poopers. I guess we're not going to go through that in the Hebrew right now because they are doing something. <laughs> okay, never mind. And I don't have time to go get my Hebrew Bible because it's over there. So I'm not going to do that. We'll look at that in a minute. Okay, let's look at that in a minute. Keep that up. The overall story here is not lost, so if we continue on. Blow the ram's horn in Gibeah, the trumpet in Ramah. Cry aloud at beth -Aven. Look behind you, O Benjamin. Ephraim shall be desolate in the day of rebuke. Among the tribes of Israel, I make known what is sure. The princes of Judah are like those who remove a landmark. So now he's bringing Judah into this. Even though this is written to the, primarily the ten other tribes of Israel, Judah gets blasted here also. I will pour out my wrath on them like water. Ephraim is oppressed and broken in judgment because he willingly walked by human precept. And guys, they still do it today. We, I was called out 22 years ago, well, almost 23 years ago. You guys are being called out now. Some of you have been out for five years. Some of you have been out for 10 years. Some of you have been out of it. We all walked by human precept, human rules, human teachings. May we not do one more day in human precepts, but may we just walk by God's beautiful precepts, by Yahweh's beautiful precepts. Therefore, I will be to Ephraim like a moth and to the house of Judah like rottenness. So the moths, they eat up stuff, they, they destroy it. When Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah saw his wound, then Ephraim went to Assyria and sent to King Jareb. Yet he cannot cure you. Like Yahweh's like, like I struck you and you're running all around to these other people to get healed? Where, where's your God? Like, come to me. He says a million times in scripture, not technically a million. I am the God who strikes you. I am the God who heals you. I am the God who brings disaster. I am the God who brings good things. Like, I just read it today. It's like, everything comes from his hand. And why would we not seek the one who loves us and wants to help us overcome, right? Yet he cannot cure you, nor heal you of your wound. For I will be like a lion to Ephraim and like a young lion to the house of Judah. I, even I, will tear them and go away. I will take them away and no one shall rescue. I will return again to my place till they acknowledge their offense. That's our jobs, people. We are the ones who have been rising up for the last 20 and 30 years who are acknowledging our offense. We are saying, our father sinned. Oh, Father God, please remember us. Forgive us for what our fathers have done. Please, Yahweh Elohim, forgive us. Hey, Sheila, Diane, okay, boo, boo, boo. is there anything else I missed? Deuteronomy 16, thank you, thank you, thank you. So, Winona, we went through Corinthians last night, the first Corinthians, and then Danielle asked tonight to go through Hosea, and everybody said yes. Which book are we in? We're in Hosea. Okay, thank you, you're frozen, huh? I wonder, Pamela, if, 
Am I freezing for other people? What you said about prayer? Okay, so Faith, could you re-ask your question, sweetie, so that I understand exactly what you're asking? Sorry, I know you young people understand all these symbols and shortcuts. <laughs> oh, it wasn't you who asked it. Somebody said, yeah, so what you said about when you had a heart attack. That's, I guess, what I was reading. I was just wondering what that was. Huh. Freezing a little for short times. Oh, Father God, please stop. Yeah, our internet. I do know that Yavi tells me it's a spiritual battle, that somebody, there are people trying to stop me, which, of course, I get them the post right on my things. Um, okay, Father God, we'll just keep praying, guys. Yavi, just rebuke that. Please help the word get out. Please let your word come out, and please help. Okay, well, we'll just keep praying. You guys keep praying, because... Satan's always trying to stop the truth. Um, and Yahweh warned me it was going to be like that tonight. Earlier, he said, <laughs> Satan's fighting. So we're just going to keep going. Yahweh's, Yahweh's got it. Um, yes, exactly. How when I, yep, he did strike me in, when I was 39. And then he was the one who healed me. And he had given that dream and everything. And that's in other things. Um, yeah, you're right. That's a good remembrance. Okay. I think I forgot that last verse. So till they acknowledge their offense, which is what we're supposed to do, then they will seek my face in their affliction. They will earnestly seek me. What affliction do you think is that? What affliction is coming? The time of Jacob's trouble. The time of Jacob's trouble. So in that our affliction, we're going to seek him. We're brought to the wilderness. And then it says, they will seek my face in their affliction. They will earnestly seek me. So we have a time of affliction coming. That is the purpose of the tribulation, to turn our faces back to the Father, to loose our hands of any strongholds we have. Father God, please, in the name of Yeshua, don't let it buffer anymore. Father God, please help for your glory, silence the enemy, and just, Father God, only let your truth be known. Please, God, work mightily. Okay, chapter six. Come and let us return to Yahweh. Listen. For he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up. How many days has Israel been scattered? Well, as of the year 2000, it was 2,730 days. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord. This is a prophecy saying in the third set of 1,000 years, Ephraim will wake up and bam, it happened, right? Because we were scattered in 730 BC. 730 BC. 2007, okay, so zero to 1,000 is day one. 1,000 to 2,000 is day two. 2,000 to 3,000 is day three. So after two days, so 1,000, 2,000, before the third day is done, on that third day, so 2,730 years later, which falls on that third day, Ephraim was woken up. Do you see that prophecy? Isn't that beautiful? Yeah, 2007. There we go, Erica. But that verse right here is very important to remember for people when they say, oh, Ephraim's, they came back, whatever. No, it literally says on the third day we'll come back. Isn't that beautiful? He will raise us up that we may live in his sight. Let us know. Let us pursue the knowledge of Yahweh. His going forth is established as the morning. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter and the former rain of the earth. Now those have some really good pictures there. I'm not going to go through it. But in Israel you have like the latter rain, which would be now after you would plant like your your basically your spring crops. So you're planting in the fall if you are agricultural, you're going to know what I, we call winter wheat. My family are farmers up in Montana. And so when you plant in the fall, in like September, October, you're planting actually for the spring, the late spring harvest, like May, June, July. Wheat, we don't harvest until July or August. But my point is you need those rains at both seasons to help the harvest and the crops cultiv be um, nourished. Okay, you get it. O oh, Ephraim, what shall I do to you? O oh, Judah, chapter six, verse four. O oh, Ephraim, what shall I do to you? O oh, Judah, what shall I do to you? For your faithfulness is like a morning cloud and like the early dew, it goes away. Therefore, I have hewn them by my prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth and your judgments are like the light that goes forth. For I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Does that mean he doesn't want his offerings? No, he's telling us the what is the heart behind all of the Torah? 
mercy. He wants us to learn mercy. When he says on these hang, on these two laws hang everything, he what? He teaches us how to love God and how to love our neighbor as ourself. And the epitome of loving our neighbor as ourself is having mercy. That's just it. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. So God would rather, you can do everything you want. You can go to church. You can tithe. You can, you can keep every synagogue Sabbath. You can do every single law perfectly by the letter. But he wants mercy and knowledge of him. And that shows a born-again heart. But like men, they transgressed the covenant. They, the, what was the whole problem? They broke the covenant, the law. It wasn't a good thing to be, it was a bad thing. There they dealt treacherously with me. Gilead is a city of evildoers and defiled with blood. As bands of robbers lie in wait for a man, so the company of priests murder on the way to Shechem. Surely they commit lewdness. I have seen a horrible thing in the house of Israel. There is the harlotry of Ephraim. Israel is defiled. Also, O Judah, a harvest is appointed for you when I return the captives of my people. So God's not just going to bring back Israel. He's going to harvest Judah as well. Angela is my mommy. Yes, she is, Isabel. Chapter 7. When I would have healed Israel, then the iniquity of Ephraim was uncovered and the wickedness of Samaria. So Samaria was one of the, Samaria was the place from which the king lived in the northern tribes of Israel. So Samaria was kind of like their, like the Jerusalem. Okay, so you had the high places of Dan and Bethel, but Samaria was where the ruling family lived. Okay, so that's where wickedness was. For they committed fraud. A thief comes in. A band of robbers takes spoil outside. They do not consider in their hearts that I remember all their wickedness. Now their own deeds have surrounded them. They are before my face. They make a king glad with their wickedness and princes with their lies. For they are all adulterers, like an oven heated by a baker. He ceases stirring the fire after kneading the dough until it is leavened. In the day of our king, princes have made him sick, inflamed with wine. So here he's drunkards and it's like a half-baked, half-baked, right? And I wonder if that's where we get that, that term from. He stretched out his hand with scoffers. They prepare their heart like an oven while they lie in wait. Their baker sleeps all night. In the morning, it burns like a flaming fire. They're all hot like an oven, just like passion for lust, like all full of lust and idolatry. And, um, and they and have devoured their judges. All their kings have fallen. None among them calls upon me. Oh, so good mercy. Yeah, exactly. That's a good one. That's a great one, Daniel. Ephraim has mixed himself among the peoples. Ephraim is a cake unturned. So think of this as like more like a pancake, okay? And if you don't turn the pancake, half of it's raw. And that's more what this is talking about. Aliens, strangers, this is not demonic aliens. Aliens have devoured his strength, but he does not know it. Listen, aliens, so Gentiles, let's use the word Gentiles here. Gentiles have devoured his strength, yet he does not know it. Yes, gray hairs are here and there on him, yet he does not know it. Do you understand that is saying that these Ephraimites were not going to understand they were the ancient people of Israel? Did you guys know you were Israelites? Did you guys understand who Ephraim was before tonight or before I started sharing? Or not me, I'm sorry, I hate to say that. Before you started watching the reels or before you started listening to the podcast, did you guys even understand about the 10 northern tribes of Israel? Maybe it was four years ago. Maybe it was six years ago. Maybe it was 12 years ago. At some point, there was a day before when you did not know that you were the ancient tribes of Israel scattered, correct? So right here, let's read that again. But this is a prophecy of, is, of Ephraim not knowing his identity. So Ephraim has mixed himself among the people. So he became the Gentiles. Ephraim is a cake unturned. Gentiles, I'm going to use the word Gentiles there, have devoured his strength. So he's with the Gentiles. Like, he's become the Gentiles. He devoured it because his strength was obedience to God, his Torah, right? But he doesn't have that anymore. But he doesn't even know it. He can't even recognize that his strength is gone, who he was as God's child. Yes, gray hairs are here and there on him, yet he does not know it. He does not know he's an ancient people of God. The gray hairs represent the ancient part of his existence, the, the, his oldness, that he's an ancient old people. Does that make sense, guys? Can I get a thumbs up if it does? Just to make sure you're following me so I'm not losing anybody. So honestly, Mary... Thank you, guys. Honestly, Mary, 
you don't always know. My my grandma was called called a dirty little Jew. Um, she told us. Um, we have history books from my Aunt Marie, so I we just happen to know. But I'm going to tell you something. Before I was told any of this, I heard God say, you're Ephraim. And I was like, I was like, this was in 2001. And I remember being like, it was like December. Yeah, December. or no, It was December. December of 2001. I was like, I remember being like, I don't know what that means. He said, no, you're Ephraim. I said, I don't know what that means. And he goes, look it up. And I looked up and it said Israel. And I'm very dumb and happy. And I'm like, huh. <laughs> yeah, I'm grafted in. I know that. And then he kept touching my forehead, saying holiness to the Lord. And he kept saying, you're a priest. And I'm like, huh, Levites. He kept saying Levite. And I'm like, huh. and I was a teacher at the time. So I was like, I was just thinking I was grafted in there. I was like, this is an interesting spiritual experience. Like God's telling me I'm grafted in Israelite, <laughs> you know? And then he had me do the 13 day fast. And then he showed me this about the, um, he showed me this, the two houses of Israel, the scattering of Ephraim and the waking up. And what's interesting I became connected with, there were not very many of us back in 2002. There was just a, so few of us who believe, who were coming to Torah. But a woman, one of my friends in Australia, she heard, the, she goes, I was just, she heard one day, just God tell her she was a Ephraim. She's like, so she had to look it up. And then another lady said, she just heard she was a Ephraim. So there was a whole bunch of us. It was really neat. Not a whole bunch, but a few of us that just heard we were a Ephraim and were kind of like, uh, what's that mean? <laughs> We just were confused. Isn't that amazing? So here's the thing. Some of us were told, but does it matter if you're a Gentile? It doesn't matter if you're grafted in? Not one iota. Caleb, who was a Kenazite, who was not even a blood Israelite, became the leader of the house of Judah, and he got to go into the promised land. One of the two spies who went in was a Gentile, and God didn't care. He loved him just as much. But he didn't get to keep his identity as a Kenazite. He became from the tribe of Judah. And so, when you love God, I mean, obviously, if you are a blood Israelite, he will reveal that to you when we go back because it says in Ezekiel 47 that we will divide the land by lot again. And that each tribe will get, I don't get a portion. Levites, I don't know what we do. I don't know what the women Levites do. I don't know. We're just going to be somewhere with our husbands, I guess. <laughs> Um, exactly, Mary. But my point is then pray. Just pray. Because pray to Father that he'd tell you and show you. Sometimes you can look at identifying markers. I will tell you, the tribe of Dan. Okay, here's a guy. Yair Davidi. Y-A-I-R. That's his first name. Yair Davidi. D-A-V-I-D-Y. He's an Orthodox Jew who has traced out historically the dispersion of the ten northern tribes. He believes the Christians are wrong, but he says unequivocally, undoubtedly, the Christians are the 10 northern tribes of Israel. Most of the modern day Christians are the 10 northern tribes scattered. And then he goes through and he does all of these really cool historical um, mappings of where the tribes were dispersed by the Assyrian army. Did you know in the Irish language, there are 730 exact Hebrew words? Exactly. They're Hebrew. That's pretty cool. Um, they can trace the tribe of Dan to Britain. Anyway, so check out Yair Davidi. His organization is called the Brit Am, so People of Covenant, Covenant People. And he does not agree with Christianity, so pray for his eyes to be open that he sees Jesus as the Messiah. That's his, his fight. But he sees that they are the 10 lost tribes. He sees that they are the brothers and sisters, which is beautiful. Pray for him. Pray for him. He's... Really cool. Okay. I hope that makes sense. And please share that with people. That that scripture right there, many people miss. Even many Messianics, I, I see they just missed that one. So we were going to be, an, Israel was going to be an ancient people, not even know it. Verse 10. And the people and the pride of Israel testify. I don't know how I got the word people there. I don't know. And the pride of Israel testifies to his face. But they do not return to Yahweh their Elohim nor seek him for all this. Ephraim also is like a silly dove without sense. A dove is supposed to be single-eyed, um, single eyed, right? Doves, in the book of Song of Songs and other else place in scripture, doves literally in creation have single eyes. They have one mate their entire life. But here, Ephraim's a silly dove without sense. She's not being single-eyed, even though she's supposed to be single-eyed on the Lord. They call to Egypt, 
They go to Assyria. How many people call the doctors when they're sick rather than Yahweh? How many people call to a bank when they need money instead of God? Like they go into debt, right? We have modern Egypt and Assyria things in our life, guys. We call all over, uh, over for help rather than going to the Creator. We need to go to the Creator. We need to go to Yahweh. Wherever they go, I will spread my net on them. I will bring them down like birds of the air. I will chastise them according to what their congregation has heard. Boom. Now, if my internet was working, I could show you this. Well, according to what their congregation, according to what their assembly, according to what their church, quote, has heard. So they've all heard. They've all heard the Torah. So now God has judged them according to this because they all knew the Torah. My per okay, perfect. Can you spell his name on here? Yes. Y A I. Oh, I see. Type it. Okay. I can't while I'm talking because I'm pretty sure I'll hit the wrong button and stop the live because, yeah, that's how tech savvy I am. So maybe somebody else can write his name for me. I will transliterate it. I'll say it one more time. Spell it. Transliterate it. What the heck? Y A I R. That's Yair. And then Davidi. D A V I D Y. And then it's Brit. B R I T. Dash um perfect and thank you, Miss Daniel. Okay, so according to what their congregation has heard, you, they are judged because they've heard it. You know what I've had people do when I was sharing Torah with them, and when we came. Okay, so I came to Torah with this friend. I didn't come at the same time. I'm sorry, we didn't come together. But I met this friend. She was had come to Torah. I came to Torah, and I was sharing with her things that God showed me in Ezekiel. You know what she did? La 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 la! Don't tell me so I'm not accountable. I was like, tell me anything so I am accountable because I don't want to spend more and more day in sin. <laughs> like, help me to know my God more and more and more. So guys, we don't want to plug our ears because we're still going to be accountable because we still heard through the earplugs. We need to seek God with all our heart zealously. Okay. Okay, verse 13. Woe to them for they have fled from me. Destruction to them because they have transgressed against me. Therefore I, re therefore I redeemed them, yet they have spoken lies against me. Yet they did not cry out to me with their heart when they wailed upon their beds. And we all see that. People get in trouble by God. And they're like, oh, please save me, please save me. And then as soon as he saves them, they turn right back to sin. They assemble together for grain and new wine. They rebel. Honestly, guys, I didn't mean to stop this here. Drunkenness is like that. I was like that. I'd be in a drunken stupor, have like a most horrible hangover, most horrible feelings. And you're like, oh God, if you just save me, if you just help me, I'll never drink again. Then you feel better and you go drink again. So praise God for forgiveness, but let's not be that person, okay? That's, but that's like what it's talking about here. They assemble together for grain and new wine. They rebel against me, though I disciplined and strengthened their arms. Yet they devise evil against me. They return, but not to the most high. They are like a treacherous bow. Their princes fall by the sword. For the cursings of their tongue, they shall be. this shall be their derision in the land of Egypt. We're not supposed to be cursing with our tongues. I hardly ever dream. Well, Father God, please, please, please give Pamela some dreams. I, I beg you, that would be... The more obedient you are, Pamela, the more dreams you're going to start getting. He gives the keys of the kingdom to the children who obey, okay? So the more you press in, the more you keep growing, Yahweh's going to bless you, okay? Set the trump chapter 8. Set the trumpet to your mouth. He shall come like an eagle against the house of Yahweh because they have transgressed my covenant. That's why they're judged. Breaking God's laws gets you in trouble. Don't break them. And rebelled against my law. Israel will cry to me, my God, we know you. Israel has rejected the good. The enemy will pursue him. They set up kings, but not by me. This is why we don't vote. Because <laughs> Yahweh told me back when I came to Torah, he said, don't you dare vote for a president. He goes, these people are not of me. You let me have my way. I will put in power who I put in power. This is not your people. This is not your system. You are an Israelite. And that was hard because I grew up in a very conservative family where you are loyal to your country. And Yahweh told me, no Pledge of Allegiance. You are not loyal to this country. You are loyal to me. And I was like, oh my goodness. There's a whole mindset shift for me. But he used this verse with me at times too. He'd remind me, do not set up a king that's not of me. He goes, I am to anoint the kings. You don't have a voice in who's king. It's supposed to be God appoints the king. He says, get out of my way. I said, you're right, Lord. They made princes, but I did not acknowledge them. From their silver and gold, they made idols for themselves, that they might be cut off. Your calf is rejected, O Samaria. They always have a calf. The Bible actually commands, this is what you might not know. If you look at the book of Exodus, there, was, there were 
golden calves around outside of the temple that held the laver. We're supposed to have graven images, but we're not supposed to worship them and they cannot become our God. We have, they were all around the temple. Like we were literally commanded to construct these carved cows, but we were never supposed to worship them. I thought I heard somebody at the door, but I think that was my husband. <laughs> okay. I'm so sorry. I got totally distracted. They're thinking like, cause we live in the middle of nowhere. Like if you're going to come to our house, you have to like want to come here because you can't just get here. You can't get here from a main road. You can't get here anywhere. We're like so back in there. But I think that was my husband. So I'm sorry for that. Like if you saw the look of like shock on my face, I was like, who would be knocking at our door? Like that's like impossible. We're through like three gated entries. <laughs> anyway, um, sorry. Your calf is rejected, O Samaria. My anger is again is aroused against them. How long until they attain to innocence? For from Israel is even this: a workman made it, and it is not of God, it is not from, and it is not God. But the calf of Samaria shall be broken to pieces. They sow the wind and reap the whirlwind. The stalk has no bud; it shall never produce meal. This is an agricultural term. The stalk has no bud; it's not producing the the grain. If it should produce, and Gentiles would swallow it up, and foreigners basically, Israel is swallowed up. Now they are among the Gentiles. Again, right? Genesis chapter 48, Ephraim would become the, the fullness of the Gentiles, the Melo Hagoyim. The 10 northern tribes of Israel were prophesied to become the Gentiles. And here's another verse saying specifically that they were literally going to be among the Gentiles. We just read in seven, chapter 7, verse 9, they weren't even going to know that they were God's people anymore. They were not going to see the gray hair on their head. They did not understand they were the ancient Israelites. Like a vessel in which is no pleasure, for they have gone up to Assyria. Like a wild donkey alone by itself, Ephraim has hired lovers. Yes, though they have hired among the nations, now I will gather them and they shall sorrow a little because of the burden of the king of princess. Because, and I think that when they sorrow a little, I think again, that's talking, I think it's a foreshadowing of like the tribulation, the, the time of Jacob's trouble that's coming to kind of purify us, refine us and push us out of here. Because Ephraim has made many altars for sin, they have become for him altars for sinning. I have written for him the great things of my law, but they were considered a strange thing. Ha, who fights the law more than anybody else? Christians. Where have we traced out the Christians? The 10 northern tribes of Israel were dispersed north by the Assyrian army and west through Europe and all the way to America. Who fights against the Torah? The Christians. And it says, here's God saying, I wrote them great things of my law. His laws weren't burdened. His laws weren't bad. But they were considered a strange thing. And they don't know them, do they? For the sacrifices of my offerings, they sacrifice flesh and eat it, but Yahweh does not accept them. Now he will remember their iniquity and punish their sins. They, will, they shall return to Egypt. Hmm. Where did most of the, where is most of Ephraim? Do you guys know? Can you think about it? What country has, so what were the characteristics of Joseph? He was going to be blessed bountifully and to, like have all sorts of riches. If you go look at Jacob's prophecies over him and Moses' prophecies, can you think of a nation that looks blessed, that is filled with Christians? What does it mean to come to Torah? That's a good question, Catherine. Uh, while I'm asking people to answer this, I'll go ahead and answer that. To come to Torah is when you understand you come into covenant with the God of your say of salvation. You've already accepted the blood of Yeshua HaMashiach as your salvation. And you're saying, I am saved from eternal damnation but now I want to obey my God and please him because I love him. So then what you do is you, you, so the picture of the Passover, you accepted the blood of Yeshua on the doorpost and the lintel, right? That your heart and your mind, your deeds and your thoughts actually is what it's symbolic of. You said, I believe Yeshua will save me from eternal death because I was a sinner and I need saved. So the death angel passed over you in Egypt. You were then commanded to leave Egypt, which is symbolic of sin, where you were held captive. And then you went through the, the Sea of Reeds or the Red Sea, and you were baptized, so to speak. That did not save you. You were already saved. And that the, the water, the book of Ephesians tells us the water is symbolic of the Word of God. 
So you go through the word and then you go to the mountain to come into covenant with God. In Hebrew, that word that, that, that um, is made there is ketubah, which is a marriage agreement. So it was God saying, here's my laws, my Torah for you. And if you want to be my people, here is how you be my bride, my bride, my people, so to speak, okay? And so when you come to Torah, you're coming to the obedience and understand uh, the understanding of obedience to our Father. You're saying, I repent from my dead works of sin. I don't want to stay in Egypt in sin. How do I learn to obey and please my God after I'm already saved? Then you come and you accept his covenant and you come to obedience. Hi, Jerry. I was wondering if you were going to see this tonight because I'm so sorry. I forget to tag. I literally go live and I forgot to tag after I pushed the go live button. And I was like, oh, I was going to tag everybody. So I'm so sorry. I love you, sweet girl. Of course, you can watch it tomorrow. I pray you're doing well. You keep your joy up, sweet girl. You stay on that ground, okay? You don't have to give in. Listen to the podcast. Yeah, okay, perfect. Okay, I hope that makes sense. They were, we were going to return to Egypt, which was symbolic of sin. And so then coming to Torah, I hope I, under, I, hope I answered your question there, sweetie. Um, who asked that again? Yeah, okay, so Catherine, I hope I answered your question for you. Okay, let's continue reading. Chapter, or, chapter 8, verse 14. For Israel has forgotten his maker and has built temples. Judah has also has multiplied fortified cities, but I will send fire upon his cities, and it shall devour his palaces. Chapter 9. Do not rejoice, O Israel, with joy like other peoples, for you have played the harlot against your God. You have made love for hire on every threshing floor. The threshing floor and the winepress shall not feed them, and the new wine shall fail in her. They shall not dwell in Yahweh's land, but Ephraim shall return to Egypt. You guys, you guys, listen. Listen to this. This is like any Christian who tells you they are freed from the law does not understand the historical prophecy that happened to the 10 northern tribes of Israel and this next verse, let me tell you. Ephraim shall return to Egypt and shall eat unclean things in Assyria. I, my eyes are blinking like, did you guys catch that? What was the curse that was going to come and be put upon the tribes of Israel who were disobeying God. God just said, I gave you wonderful things from my laws and you rejected them. He says, fine, you're gonna go back to Egypt. You're gonna go back to sin. You're gonna go back because he already said in chapters one and two, you're not gonna be my people anymore, but then I'm gonna call you back and be, you're gonna be my people. Exactly, Faith. The curse, so when they say they're free to eat pig, step back because that lightning bolt might strike. <laughs> Isaiah 65, verse 17, Isaiah 66, verse 5, say, when Jesus returns a second time, those eating swine's flesh will be destroyed. A curse that was put upon the 10 northern tribes of Israel, who we just read, what, three times, were going to become the Gentiles. They were literally going to not know their identity as God's people. It matches with Genesis 48, verse 16. They were going to become the Gentiles and they were going to lose their identity as Israel and they were going to, part of the curse and the punishment was that they would eat unclean things. So you please underline that, write that on your forehead, write that on every wall around you. When somebody tells you, when somebody tells you that they are free to eat pig now, that God freed them to do that, you say that verse. Because Peter's vision doesn't say he got up and ate pig. Peter's vision, which is eight years after Yeshua died and rose from the dead, Peter gets up and says, huh, I wonder what the vision meant. He says that in his own writing. He says he wondered what the vision meant. And it says, and then he heard the knock with the men at the door and said the interpretation. Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 11. Oh, then I knew to call no Gentile common or unclean. Because why? Because that was the first fruits of the return of the 10 northern tribes of Israel. Ooh, want me to prove that? Let's go to James chapter 1, to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. Ooh, let's look at who Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, says, to those of the dispersion. Do you get that? The New Testament Jewish writers wrote to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. Why were they scattered abroad? Because they had become not God's people. Do you see how that goes together. This verse is huge to share 
with Christians who say they are free to eat it. You should say, no, you're cursed to eat it. Part of the blindness that came upon you for disobeying in the first place, for your forefathers disobeying, was that you would return to Egypt. America is the end time Egypt. And you're going to eat unclean things. Yikes, guys. And it specifically is in Assyria. We know Assyria is the one who scattered the 10 northern tribes of Israel. That's what that's prophetic of. They shall not offer wine offerings to Yahweh, nor shall their sacrifices be pleasing to him. It shall be like bread of mourners to them. All who eat it shall be defiled. For their bread shall be for their own life. It shall not come into the house of Yahweh. Again, he took his sacrifices away from them. He said, nope, you don't even get to take part in my ways anymore. What will you do in the appointed day? In the feast day, that appointed day, there's Moed, Moedim. What will you do? That's the same word for festival or feast in Hebrew. What are you going to do in those appointed times? And in the day of the feast of Yahweh, what are you going to do? He's like, and he's like taunting them, basically saying, he's rebuking them. You don't get to come to my feast anymore. You don't get to do it anymore. For indeed they are gone because of destruction, because God destroyed them. Not because he didn't want them to be done, but because Israel had perverted them. Egypt shall gather them up, Memphis shall bury them, nettles shall possess their valuables of silver, thorns shall be in their tents. The days of punishment have come, the days of recompense have come, Israel knows. The prophet is a fool, the spiritual man is insane because of the greatness of your iniquity and great enmity. The watchman of Ephraim is with my God. So the watchman's like been crying this out. But the prophet is a fowler snare in all his ways. The reason being because when a prophet prophes tells you, it you're caught in those words. You're caught in the judgment, right? So the watchman's calling out and saying, hey, 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 it's coming. This judgment's coming. Watch out. The prophet is telling you, stop. This is wrong. You're going to be judged. And that's what ensnares them then because the word came against them. And then when they transgressed it, they were caught in it. Enmity in the house of his God. They are deeply corrupted. As in the days of Gibeah, what happened in Gibeah? Do you guys remember? This is in the story of back in Judges. Yeah. Yeah, Judges. I'm sorry. Was it Joshua or Judges? So in, in Gibeah, there were men. Do you remember the Levite? Okay, so this Levite went there with his concubine who had played the harlot. Well, he went to get his concubine. So he didn't like go there with her. He went to get his concubine and they stayed in Gibeah. And the men of Gibeah raped the woman to death. Like she lay dead. So the man... This is so gross. He cut her into 12 pieces. Like he took her. I don't even know how you would do that, but that is so disgusting. It makes me like want to vomit. He cut her body into 12 pieces, sent it by way of, okay, hi, Mary. Okay, Mary, don't forget this. The whole episode is on the page under videos when it's all done and on the, just on the wall itself. Okay, so Gibeah was in the tribe of Benjamin. And this, okay, this man goes there. He goes to get his concubine who had gone from him. He stays in Gibeah that night. And the men come and surround the house and take his concubine because they wanted him at first to rape, which is disgusting. But instead he said, here, here take the, the house owner said, here, take this concubine, take his concubine and my daughter. They raped her to death. He cut her into 12 pieces. This is in the book of Judges. Please go read it. Cut her into 12 pieces and sent it to every one of the tribes. And basically was like, we need to go to war against these Benjamites. So they all go to war against the Benjamites. I know, right, Tara? So he go, they go to war against the Benjamites. And the Benjamites, rather than repenting, they cover up and hide the sin of the wicked men. They don't turn over, because the, the men of Israel come to the men of Benjamin and say, hey, just turn over the, these vile men. We're going to destroy them. And Benjamin's like, no. So they start fighting. Like, they defend them. And that's why God always has warned me, do not defend the men of, those wicked men of Gibeah. <laughs> do not de be on, don't defend somebody who's wicked, ever. Don't stand in God's way. So that's what this is talking about. It's referring to that thing. And like, that was such a disgusting, vile act to, in God's eyes. He's like, that's what this is like. As in the days of Gibeah, he will remember their iniquity. He will punish their sins. I found Israel like, this is Yahweh then. I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers as the first fruits on the fig tree in its first season. But they went to Baal Peor. Like he's like, and that's in the book of Numbers. 
and they went, you remember they, they sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play and separated themselves to that shame. They, they were serving pagan gods right away, like going to Christmas dinner and all these pagan holidays. They became an abomination like the thing they loved. As for Ephraim, their glory shall fly away like a bird. No birth, no pregnancy, and no conception. Though they bring up their children, yet I will bereave them to the last man. Yes, woe to them when I depart from them. Just as I saw Ephraim like Tyr planted in a pleasant place. I want to point out the connection. In prophecy, T-Y-R-E has been linked very prominently to the Western lands, specifically from Britain, okay? Hmm. Who is a British colony? America, right? We were a British colony. And many of the 10 other tribes of Israel are in America. America is filled with Joseph's. We have been very fruitful, very blessed in all of our ways. So here's a link, just as I saw Ephraim like Tyr. So America became like Tyr, T-Y-R-E. <laughs> Listen, when you see prophecy, like Isaiah 23 then says that Tyr will be forgotten 70 years, the days of one ruler. Queen Elizabeth just ruled 70 years. The tribe of Dan is not sealed before the tribulation. Jacob tells us in his blessings in Isaiah and in Genesis 49 or 48, 49, that Dan will be the one who judges the people. He's the serpent, by the way. I mean, come on, link this all together. Do you, are you guys following me on this logic? Like, the, that's how I'm telling you. They know that the Western lands are Tyre, T-Y-R-E. It's Britain and America. Okay, Tyre and Tarshish are linked with that. They're planted in a pleasant place, so Ephraim will bring out his children to the murderer. Give them, O Yahweh, what will you give them? Give them a miscarrying womb and dry breasts. And how many children of Israel have had miscarriages? It's phenomenal, the amount of Americans that have miscarriages. It's sad. And I think it's, and, well, I know it's part of the punishment. There was, in fact, when we first came to Torah, one of the families was not truly following Torah and coming out of some of the pagan ways. And the father opened me this to this scripture that morning that she was going to miscarry. And he gave my mother a dream that the, yeah, that the lady said, I'm not pregnant anymore. And God said, they're, they're committing adultery. They won't just come to me. And they wouldn't. They, and it was sad. She miscarried that day. So I, I'm going to, I just know that often when we miscarry, God is trying to get our attention. We're miscarrying the innocence of life he's given us, the spiritual life that he was trying to burden us. So if we continue in idolatry and harlotous ways, and I don't judge, I'm just speaking truth, guys. I gotta speak truth. Sometimes we need to hit our knees and say, God, did I miscarry what you were birthing in me by your spirit? Did I abominate it? Did I adulter it? Did I go the wrong way? I miscarried after I had my son, right? I didn't under, like, okay, first of all, we sinned because I was pregnant within a month of having my son. I did not know you were supposed to wait that many days because guess what? Good Christians don't read the Bible and I had not read the Bible. So I got pregnant right away, right away. And then of course my body couldn't handle it, but I still feel that there was something where God wanted me to know I was miscarrying my innocence, okay? Because when my son was two weeks old, I nearly died. I ate shellfish. I heard the voice of God say, I told you in my word not to eat this. That was back in 1990. Well, he was born 98, and that was 99, because two weeks, he was born the very last day of 99, 98. Um, yeah, you can't really join a church, Kimberly. I mean, those are the, we're supposed to right now in the end days, the Bible says, come out of Babylon, lest you be destroyed in her midst. Babylonian mythology is what the modern church system is based on. So the Bible says to keep the seventh day Sabbath. The modern church follows the Babylonian tradition of the first day of the week, of the Sunday, the day of the sun god. Um, the Bible says to keep seven holidays from Leviticus 23, where to remember seven holidays or Moedim or feasts of God, all about the Messiah. They're prophecies and foreshadowings of what he would and did do, right? Well, the church does all these Babylonian mythology holidays. Christmas was a Babylonian holiday for the sun god. Easter was a Babylonian fertility goddess. That was her physical name. And so, yeah, aren't, I'm going to beg you, please don't go to church. <laughs> please do not go to church. It's okay to be in the wilderness. Remember we just talked about here at the beginning of this book where God's going to bring you to the wilderness. You're going to feel alone, but you're not. He needs you to know him intimately. That's the same thing as Ezekiel 20 talked about. Remember how we matched that all up? You're going to go through a period of time. Don't feel lonely. You have God. Press in and know him. Think about it as your time, like when you want, when you first met your husband or 
if you don't have your husband, I'm sorry guys, or your wife or whatever. When you first meet your spouse, you want all the time you can get together and alone, right? You're trying to get to know each other. Think of that as this period of time for, with God. Get in his word like never before. Let him just flood over you and into you his Holy Spirit and speak to you his love and his truth and his joy and his ways so that you know his voice, okay? So take it as a beautiful thing. We we sometimes want so badly, again, to, we're, we're instant gratification, and we want that flesh. We want to see somebody, but let that still, calm voice come over you. Let him speak to you, okay? I have felt so much better since leaving. Yes, right? Because you're probably hearing his voice better, right? Because when you're in that system, you can't hear. It's, there's, there's too many spirits speaking. You can kind of hear his voice, but you're going to hear a lot of other demons as well. Okay. Verse 15, chapter 9. All their wickedness is in Gilgal, for there I hated them. Oh. <sighs> For there I hated them. Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated. And here he turns and hates Jacob, Israel, because of the evil of their deeds. But he already promised us at the very beginning he was going to hate us, send us away, make us not his people. But he says in the same place where you're not my people, I'm going to bring you back. And then we read in that next chapter, hey, you're wicked, you're disgusting, but I'm going to allure you back to me. And then in that day, Judah and Ephraim are going to point the one head over themselves. So remember, he never casts off his people for all they do. Please go read Jeremiah 33, where it says, Have you seen what the people say about these two houses? If you can count the stars of the heaven, he says, or if you can count the sand of the sea, then you can cast away my people for all they have done against me. Can you count the sand of the sea? Or sand of the sea? Can you count the stars of the heaven? Nope. And that's what he goes on to say. Yahweh says that in Jeremiah there. He says, you cannot break my covenant with Israel for all they have done. Because Christians like to say, oh, Jews, the Israelites messed up, so they aren't his people anymore. Well, you take that up with God, because God already said, my father, God, my daddy, God already said, um, for all we've done, you can't cast us away. He's going to punish us. He's going to discipline us. And then he's going to bring us back. Praise God. Hallelujah for his covenant. My God does not change. Right? I know. That's, that's hard, Mary, huh? I'm wrestling with the first. You know what, Alicia? I, I understand, sweetie. It can be hard. You be so filled with joy at your God showing you his truth. Be so enamored and, and, and blessed to know that he chose you to speak to. Just stand so firm and rejoice in that. Um, I used to keep my store open on Pagan Miss. We call it Pagan Miss, thanks to my friend Morgan. She's very smart at making up those kind of words. And so we call it Pagan Miss because of her. And I always had my store open. I We would just, we never, we just ignored it. We didn't treat it as anything. And people would come to my store and they were like, I'm just surprised you're open. So I would get to share. And I would tell everybody very loudly on social media, we will be open tomorrow. I would not say the name of the day. Or I would call it the date. Like, hey, we'll be open on the 25th of December. You know, we're not going to blah, 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 blah. Come on in if you need anything. And it's just, you just treat it. You don't give it special acknowledgement. If you're alone and your family's going to be doing it, then just go somewhere. Go on a hike. Go on a walk. Go camping. Go do something. But you honor your God and you're going to feel such peace and blessing and love. Um, I know it's pretty loud. How would I go about telling my partner about these things? So that's a good question. What I did with my husband is <laughs> I'm an all in immediate in like I don't sin another minute right I'm like so I did my 13 day fast God revealed to me on day 11 of the fast all the pagan holidays and that I he had been calling me a frame at that point for like two months no two months yeah three months and I was like I'm a frame I don't know what that means <laughs> You know what I mean? And he kept telling me I was a Levite, which my family were blood Levites. I mean, to be honest, my grandma knew she was a Jew. I had no idea what any of that meant. We were raised very mainstream Christian by that point because they were always messianic. Anyway, sorry. Um, What I did, like that night, I found out about Christmas and stuff. So it was late at night. It was like 11 o'clock, 10 o'clock. I go home and that next morning... Every single Christmas thing, everything. I had it boxed up and at the door. So my husband comes home. He's like, what is this? And I said, look, 
I can't force you to do anything. I cannot force you to obey God. I'm going to love you and respect you no matter what you decide. But I'm never doing it again. So this is my declaration to you and the world and everybody else. I'm never doing a thing of it. I mean, I didn't even think about it. Because here's the thing. When you're 13 days, no food, and it's the voice of God. Like, the voice of God literally told me on Friday night at sunset, this is my rest. Now enter it. <laughs> like, I had, did not know before that. That was a Sabbath. We were such good Christian Jews who I didn't know. I knew John 3, 16. <laughs> if you asked me what the Sabbath was, I'd be like, I have no clue. I mean, I was, I am dumb and happy. I live in oblivion until God tells me otherwise. And then I know something. <laughs> so the point being, like, I was like at the door with it. And my husband said, he goes, I felt respect from you because you didn't force, he goes, you didn't force me. So I didn't force him. But I'm thank God my husband's really smart and he had studied history and he knew that Christmas was pagan. I didn't, I didn't. He, but my husband read the encyclopedia at age eight. Praise God, right? <laughs> so he goes, oh, I know it's pagan. He goes, I think it's dumb anyway. He goes, so whatever, get rid of it. But if he had not gotten rid of it and there were situations where we were not in agreement, what I did is I removed myself from the situation. He knew where I stood. I did not condemn him, but I did not partake with him. He said, Mel, your steadfast resilience to your faith in God and your inability or your unswerving, your, what's the word I'm looking for, guys? He said, I did not waver and did not compromise for him. I did not sin for him, nor did I condone his sin. And he said, that's what convicted him that my faith was real. I didn't judge him though, and I wasn't mean. He said that, he goes, you were very respectful. He goes, but you weren't gonna budge and you weren't gonna help me. Because I told him, I didn't throw away his pork. Like we had, my dad had just butchered a hog. We were good Montana farmers at the time we were in Wyoming, but <laughs> you know what I mean? So just butchered that hog, it's in the freezer. Um, my husband's favorite food was ham. He liked his bacon and stuff like that. And I did not throw it away, but I said, I will not touch it. I will not serve it to you. I will not cook it for you, and I will not buy it for you. Please respect me in that. He goes, no problem. I respect that. I said, but I'm also not going to throw it away. That's your sin. That's your relationship with God. That's your walk. So a couple weeks, maybe a month, few months into it, into my Torah obedience, I come home, and I see the, the garbage filled with all the pork. And I said, mm, what happened? Mm. He started, he just, he knew, he goes, I knew the scriptures. He goes, I actually knew the scriptures. He goes, remember I used to be a pastor. So being a Christian pastor made my husband an atheist because he's so smart that he read the Bible and he's like, these Christians aren't following the Bible. This is made up. So he became an atheist because rather than studying like what well, would be real, he's like, this is all made up. They're not doing anything the Bible says. Like they're literally doing exactly what the Bible says not to do. This must be a farce which I think is kind of interesting. So being a Christian drove him to atheism. And then when he met me and I started following the Torah, it's what brought him back to God because the Torah, he said, oh, he said, I knew that's what the Bible said. So when I saw you doing it, he goes, I, that's what, he, then he knew the Bible was real because I was actually following the Bible. <laughs> anyway, um, let me just make sure, let's catch up here if I have any questions. Um, yeah, you know what? They, People tried to push it on me. They tried to send my son presents and I, and I just threw them in the trash. I said, if you send him something, I'm not accepting it. I'm not going to condone this. I said, I love you, but we're not doing it anymore. They would, they tried to force it with me too, but, and, and I'm not an aggressive person or so the whole time I was just like, I remember, I just remember this one instance. I was just trembling and I was like, yeah, not going to do it. Not going to do it. But I was like faithful to God. I just chose God. Like I love God. I'm not going to compromise against my God for anybody. Like nobody's worth me getting smacked from God about or in trouble with. You guys don't lose your salvation or don't lose a notch in heaven for anybody, okay? Nobody's worth it. Love them, pray for them, but you better love your God more. So it's okay, Mary, when they force it on you, just be gentle and calm and say, don't be mean or aggressive back because then they have that emotional thing over you. Just be like, thank you for thinking of me. I pre What I always say, I say, I appreciate the sentiment. I understand you don't know or you're not familiar with this or you're whatever, but that's where your heart is right now. I said, but I can't accept it because I know what God says in the Bible. And so I can't accept it, but I love the, I love you. And we can continue to talk about this. I'd love to go through scriptures with you. Would you love to go through the scriptures? And so that's how I handle it. But I mean, I told you, I mean, I was, <laughs> I was rejected. <laughs> like, but I wasn't rejected. I had God. 
<laughs> I had Yeshua, so it's all good. Um, yeah, my husband is having a hard time getting away from the holidays, but I had to put my sorry, can I I had to put my foot down and I told him we can go see family, but I do not want to decorate and I do not want to do gifts, nothing. I just um just spending time with family, I know it's probably still not good. So here's what I always tell him to. Yeah, and sometimes so I just I don't do it if it's at a pegamist. Now my family and I, the my mom, thank God, and my dad started to obey the Torah shortly after I did after fighting very, very viciously <laughs> for a while. Um, and then they started obeying. Um, sometimes we would end up together, but we didn't even, it didn't, we didn't think about that day. And we definitely, so here's the thing, please listen to the podcast, the, I keep saying podcast, but the live episode from last night, because we specifically addressed that issue, sweetie. Um, who am I talking to? Car um, Carissa. We talked about it last night in the book of Corinthians. And so here's the thing. You don't need to compromise with your husband. You don't compromise with your husband. You stay faithful to God, okay? And so your husband's choice, so you can't control him. Let him make his choice. But he cannot entice you to sin. You need to be Abigail in the face of a Nabal. If your husband wants to go to family and does it, that's on him. But when you already know it's wrong to go to those sacrifices and those dinners that were for pagan gods for the sake of the conscience, you're still telling them it's okay that they're doing it if you go. So please pray about that. Really pray about it because it says in the, in the book of Corinthians that you don't want to enable somebody or embolden is the word it uses, embolden somebody to continue in sin by your actions. And so even though you know that idol's nothing, even if you know that demon is not above your God and not real, be really careful. You walk this walk alone and there's nothing in scripture that says your husband stands in front of God for you. It says you'll stand alone before Yeshua. Like you're going to stand alone. If you are doing foolish things and your husband doesn't correct you or teach you, he's going to pay for that. He's supposed to correct you. So that's, but see, when he's not obeying God, like Nabal, you do not obey Nabal over God. Abigail obeyed God. David, so to speak, over Nabal. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Not judging. I just got to speak the truth or I get so much trouble from God. So my job is to encourage you in truth, not to be, you know, that's why, you know, I can never be paid anyway. Nobody did. I'm not going to get paid because you get that. We think that's sinful and wrong. We've talked about that. My point is, I can't, I have to answer it honestly. I just have to warn you so that you can do the right thing because you are God's child. You are his emissary. You're his lighthouse there. Like you're the only light they're going to see. And if you compromise and say it's okay, then they're going to be like, oh, she's doing it too. But if you're the light who says, no, I'm not going to do it, they're going to be like, why is that light over there different than all this darkness over here? They're going to see the differentness, the holiness, because you did not come to the pagan dinner. Okay. I'm going to keep reading. Um... I'm going to start in verse 15 again. All their wickedness is in Gilgal, for there I hated them because of the evil of their deeds. I will drive them from my house. I will love them no more. All their princes are rebellious. If Phrym is stricken, the root is dried up. They shall bear no fruit. Yes, were they to bear children, I would kill the darlings of their womb. My God will cast them away because they did not obey him. They did not get cast away because they were obeying the law. They got cast away because they were not obeying. And they shall be wanderers among the nations, the Gentiles. Israel empties his vine. He brings forth fruit for himself. Okay, let me pause. You guys want to keep going or are you getting tired? I, I can keep going. So my ex still wants to celebrate all these holidays with the kids. I'm so sorry, Faith. Yeah, Daniel. Okay, thank you, Daniel, for stepping in. Um, you're right. We're never alone. No, I'm not awesome. Um, Yahweh is, but thank you. I understand. Yeah, it is difficult. It is difficult. I have been the bad the bad mom that was actually the good one because um, we don't do birthday parties nothing like that and now my husband's totally on board he sees how wicked birthdays are it's like the number one satanic holiday do you know that it's more important to a satanist to celebrate a birthday than halloween please go look that up it's all about self-worship it's the one day they say you get to worship yourself as god because the world revolves around you it's your day uh that's not biblical <laughs> we're not supposed to do that we're just supposed to turn all glory to god anyway my husband went and got my son not even just a little present. He went and bought him a four-wheeler. So who's the mean mom who won't partake in it and says, yeah, I'm not going to do anything with that. I think that's just, a, we just don't, I don't want to do that. You know, so here they're having all fun. Woo, 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 woo. 
And I'm just sitting over there by myself. I'm like, I'm not doing it. I'm not partaking in it. Baby, I love you, but I want you to honor God with your life. I don't want you to think things are about you. I want you to be humble and pure and holy before your Lord. A couple years later, my husband's right on board and that went in the trash. So don't spend money on stuff that you're going to have to throw away that is defiled by pagan gods. <laughs> so we just, I just did my ground. I, you can't make me sin. You can't make me sin. Nobody can make you sin. We have our own choices. And so let's just choose God because in the end, we're exercising that spiritual muscle then of obedience, faith, love, humility. Let's just exercise that muscle. Okay, verse, I'm sorry, chapter. Did I just turn the page? Yeah, keep going. Okay. Yes, the cornucopia is pagan. So, okay. Yeah, I'm assuming Thanksgiving came up. Thank you, Danielle, for saying. So Thanksgiving in and of itself. There are pagan traditions now in Thanksgiving. The original Thanksgiving was not pagan. Is it okay to celebrate? I don't do it. You know why? Because we have seven holidays of God. So why would we reject all of the seven holidays of God to do this one to get fat and eat a whole bunch of fattening food? Okay, it's whatever. But technically, the I mean, honestly, if you want, I am into intellectual honesty. That's the only way you know the truth. The first people at the end of that thing had no knowledge of the Feast of Tabernacles. They were not making a replacement ceremony, which would have been sin. But they were literally saying, thank you, God, for getting us through the winter. We have had a horrible stretch of things. Like all of us died the first roundabout. Some of us got kept here. We couldn't, we kept not being able to make it through the winter in this, in this land. Now we have this harvest. We've brought it in. We finally figured out, not just the winter, I'm sorry, but we finally figured out how to cultivate the land, how to grow some things, you know, the, the Native Americans helped us. Let's just thank God. The pilgrims truly did believe in God, despite the fact they were still antinomians and against the law. So the first Thanksgiving didn't have a cornucopia. It didn't have anything like that. They were really just saying, thank you, God, for helping us get through. <laughs> like, thank you that we didn't die this time like everybody else the last time. And, well, not everybody, obviously, but what happened over time is they began to introduce pagan elements into it. And so even all the videos that I've seen that try to say, they say the same thing that I'm saying. They just try to say the whole thing, but they're not being intellectually honest because the first Thanksgiving wasn't based on those things and didn't include those things. So those got added in over time. So is the cornucopia sinful? Yep, it was like Zeus's horn or something like that. A whole bunch of gross things like that. Um, yeah. Yeah, honestly, the internet has made it really bad because you can't even find true history. So that's why I used to be a college professor and I would I taught research writing and stuff like that. You need to go to like ancient actual history writings. The internet is a very dangerous place to find your information. People don't even use old books anymore because the books actually had to research and usually usually it was much more accurate. I mean, they took painstaking time to research and, and create evidence. Now people say whatever they want and put it on the internet and then people say that, oh, that was research. That's not research. I'm sorry, I don't mean that mean, but please get off the internet if you want to do real research and go back to the historical documents. That's how I, okay, so with the name Yahweh, Yahusha, Yah, Yehovah, if you want to look at historical documents, the first manuscript that shows the name of the tetragram with any vowel points is from the first century, and it's to is from the Samaritans that are just north, and they still exist to this day. They have it in their libraries, and it says Yahweh. That is the name that they have from the first century writing. After the sixth century manuscripts, this is not internet stuff. These are old writings. Then they began using the word Yehovah. Okay, but the one that is found among the Samaritans, the reason that we, I believe, and that I feel the Father has shown me, it is more accurate is because it was the Israelites, the Samaritans were half-breeds of the northern tribes of Israel with Assyria. They were scattered to this place that was just north and east of Israel, and I cannot remember the name of the village, but to this day they say the name Yahweh, and they have a manuscript from the first century, original manuscript, and they had not been influenced by the Masoret scribes who tried to prevent people from speaking the sacred name of Yahweh. So in by the 6th century, the Masoretes had already introduced the concept of let's not utter the sacred name. And then therefore, when they put vowel points on to make the word Yehovah, after the 6th century, those are the vowel points you'll see, but then they were already not 
they were not uttering the name, whereas the Samaritans had not been influenced by any of the Judaistic principles because the Judaism was affecting Judah and these were the 10 northern tribes of Israel. So they had preserved the name. These people have always kept the Sabbath. They have always not eaten pork. They have always held sacred the Torah. Interesting. And so there's no way it could be Yahuwah. That doesn't work in, in, it doesn't work in Hebrew. You can't have three open con- syllables. It could be Yahweh. Like, I mean, if you, you know, sometimes people say that B was a W, but Hebrew has never been a dead language into the, in the aspect of where people didn't speak it in liturgical senses because they've always read it. There's always been rabbis who have read it. So it's never been lost other than as a colloquial national speech language. And it's always been a vav sound. Like they try to say that the Paleo Hebrew was W and they might be right, but there's no evidence of that. All of the ancient, man, everything, of it, if you look at old Hebrew writings and everything, when they would pronounce it and the way that the people did pronounce it has always been a v sound, except for some people think that way before, like in the early BCs, that it was a W over it. That, okay, so let's give them that. Let's And there was a difference between the Ashkenazi and the Shephardic Jews. So let's say that the W sound was what it was. Okay, then it could be Yahweh. Okay? But they don't say Dawid, it's David. And if you talk, it's just one of those things when I asked the Spirit, I asked the Father to show me. And then back in 2005, a little girl who did not know the Torah, who did not know God, did not know Yah, would not have known his name, ran to my house. She was a little girl that was just, her father did not take care of her. So she would always come and eat at my house and play with my son. She was eight and my son was like four or five at the time. Five. Yeah, five. And so anyway, she ran to my house one morning and she said, Melissa, Melissa, I have to tell you a dream I had. I mean, this little girl didn't go to fellowship with us. She didn't, we didn't, you know what I mean? And so, anyway, she told me her dream. And in the dream, he appeared to her because she, I didn't know this at the time that she had been, was a thief because I probably wouldn't have let her in my house. I, I still would have loved her. still would have taken care of her, but I would have been very cautious, you know? I'm not. Anyway, in the dream, the door, she said she was in sitting in darkness. This is an eight-year-old girl who doesn't know God. She's sitting in darkness And the door opens and she sees a man walk in and light just floods in with him. She says, floods into the room. And he looks at her and he says, do you know who I am? And she says, yeah. And he says, I'm Yahweh. And so then I did ask her, I said, was it Yahweh or Yahweh? She goes, and then she just froze. And she she just said, well, it just sounded like that. (laughs) Like, so she knew it was a V or W. So I will tell you what he told her. And what he's always told me in my what that's what I've always heard. I'm not going to judge somebody if you say something different because those are the debatable issues that we don't need to divide over. Um, but I'm going to go off that first century manuscript because I've already heard, when Yahweh came to that little girl and said Yahweh, and then which I think that's what she said at first, and she just wasn't certain. And then you look at the first century manuscript of the ten of the Samaritans who had not been affected by the Masoret scribes and the influence of the Judaism, because it had already been scattered by 730 BC, and they have always preserved the Torah obedience, and they literally say Yahweh and have it written in their writings. I'm, I'm going to stick with what I've been going with. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but I don't judge if somebody wants to say Yeho- Yehovah or Yahweh um, or Yahweh. Um, it cannot be Yahuwah. That just doesn't work. Like, that's not grammatically possible, but it could be Yahweh, Yahweh. It just doesn't, this is not what I'm going with because it's not what I feel that God, God has told me, but I don't judge on that. Anyway, that was, how did I get there? What was I talking about? We were talking about, <laughs> oh my goodness, oh my goodness. What were we talking about um, eventually that we got there? Um, Oh, okay. So here, that's, it's not off topic. We're still talking. We can, apparently I can get off topic too. So don't even worry. I love God. I do have a problem with drinking. What advice do you have for me? Um, hi. So is it Dijon or D, 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 well, Dijon, how, am I saying that wrong? Dij, Dijon, I don't know how to say that. I'm so sorry. I love your name though. I love it. Um, it's, it's really pretty. Um, that's addiction, okay? And so I used, I don't touch alcohol because I had a problem. 
Like it wasn't one beer a night for me, it was 12. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm, ask my husband. It, I mean, I was a partier. So um, you're gonna have to press in with the Holy Spirit. You're going to have to rebuke the demons of addiction, but you need to know the scripture and why you are doing what you're doing. When you sweep a house clean, when you sweep a room clean, seven demons stronger come to attack you. So if you wanna break off an addiction, when you want to break off an addiction, you can't just say, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus and then go. You need to know why are you breaking this off? What was the reasons? Because what your your whole purpose, your whole, your whole sustenance should be God, Yahweh, Yeshua, not, not alcohol. So you need to know why you're doing what you're doing and then find scriptures to support you so that when Satan comes to you and says, eh, just have a little drink, you're like, no, I will not defile the temple of the Lord. No, I will not be a drunkard. Drunkards do not enter the kingdom of heaven. No, I will not. You know, you have to be able to quote it just like Yeshua did. And so make sure you're prepared with that. Then rebuke that demon. Get over it. Ask for prayer. I'll pray with you. We can pray with you. I do pray, Father God, right now in the name of Yeshua. We ask that you lead Dijon on that Um DJ, I don't know how to pronounce it. I'm so sorry. I feel terrible. Um, Father God, please rebuke that demon. Please fill that void with you. Fill that place that goes to the drinking for the stress relief, for the, the numbness of life, how it hurts so bad. Father God, please take away all that pain and you feel, you feel with love for you. Please, Father. Okay, so we're here for you. I'll keep praying. Uh, you can always call. I talk to people all the time one-on-ones. Um, I'll be there for you if you need to do a prayer at some point. But you need to make sure you're ready to fill up that space with the truth of Yahweh. That's what overcomes it. Okay, um, let's see. Do you keep kosher? Absolutely. So kosher just means clean. Do I follow the rabbinic practice of no meat and milk? Absolutely not, because Abraham served Yahweh curds and meat at the same meal. The Bible says not to cook a kid in its mother's milk. Doesn't and that's a goat. It does not say not to cook meat in milk. They just that was a Judaism law that says, oh, just in case if that meant these other things. So I follow kosher as far as I want to make sure it's biblically clean, not contaminated by shellfish or pork or humans or any other unclean flesh. But here's the problem, rabbi, the rabbis, and I've talked to the circle, you rabbi. I'm like, why are you koshering genetically modified organisms? You know that's an unclean source of that, the insertion of a gene of a different species into this. That's wrong. He goes, well, technically, yes, but it was unclean, but now we feel since it's a, a component of the new source that was clean, we leave it as that. So that's wrong that they kosher certified GMOs. But what you can use it for, the Circle U, Star K, COR, the two tablets, what all the different agencies... It helps you to understand there's no pork, shellfish, or anything or like that in it. Stay away from just the letter K, because the letter K, they'll kosher pork gelatin and jello and stuff. So, but you definitely need to eat biblically clean. Um, um, exactly. So, no, I you're talking about Thanksgiving, RJ, I'm assuming. Um, I, I feel this. <laughs> I feel like we have seven festivals in the Bible. And the Feast of Tabernacles is the one that specifically addresses the harvest. So if we truly want to just turn our hearts back to God, we would identify that as a season of like, this is when the Father really is commanding us to give thanks for the harvest he's given us. I can tell you, I do not believe it's, okay, it is, it is 100% sinful to do a birthday party. I'm gonna just tell you. It is 100% sinful to do um like Purim, which was a whole different story. We'll go there later. Um, like the whole Hanukkah story. That's all made up. Like talk to any, I've talked to so many Jewish rabbis in Israel. They all admit it's made up because like, I confront them all the time. I'm like, why are you teaching this lies? You know, this was a made up story. Nobody went eight days. The menorah was not lit for eight days. The, the dreidel is all paganism. And here's the thing. If we are going to celebrate a temple, the rededication of a temple, shouldn't we have that temple still standing there? Should we not have not? It's like, like we literally lost it for our disobedience. He tore it down because we sinned. So why would we have a housewarming party where the house just burned down? Let's just celebrate the house that burned down? Like, no, let's like think about what we did to lose that house. So that's really dumb. But with Thanksgiving, it's like, I honestly, <laughs> I don't wanna counsel anybody wrong. It's technically not pagan. 
But it are are you? It just this is your heart with God. Are you? Are you setting aside the seven feasts of God and ignoring them, and then doing Thanksgiving? Do you know what I'm saying? Like, why would you choose that rather than the ones God said? And then, is Thanksgiving pagan? No. Are there pagan elements on it? Yes. Should you stay away from those? Absolutely. So honestly, it has to be your heart to God. But definitely don't partake in like the Black Friday sales and stuff because that's all the start of the Christmas season. Like all the Black Friday sales are just for Christmas. So we don't want, like yesterday we talked about, for the sake of conscience of the, the, the people, we don't want... We don't want to put a stumbling block in it and embolden them to sin. We don't want to, you know, get, you get what I'm saying. So I think that's a great question. Um, and, then, and then I think Carissa with the ornaments. Um, every single thing that was tainted by anything, I just took to the dump and destroyed. I took thousands of dollars of stuff. My mom took thousands upon thousands of dollars of stuff. If she had received any jewelry, rings, or anything, God had told her to get rid of it. He had told me to get rid of it. I just crush it, and guess, guess what? He's provided abundantly more than ever I have gotten rid of. So obedience is better than sacrifice. Don't hold on to anything. To me, it's like I'm not going to be Lot's wife who looks back and turns into a pillar of salt, and I'm not going to be um, uh, Achan who took of the accursed things and kept it in his tent when it was supposed to be destroyed. I'm just not doing it. <laughs> I'm not doing it. I'm like, nothing's worth separating me from God because he owns the cattle on a thousand hills and like he, he, he will just like provide what you need. And so for me, I had to throw away a brand new guitar that was not cheap <laughs> but because I've got it for a pagan thing. And man, I felt so free. I was like, thank you, God, that you are more than these things in my life. Wham, threw it right in that trash and I broke it so nobody could take it. <laughs> I made sure... I made sure that it was destroyed. Any ounce. What it does is it breaks off the to the demon world. It's a sign like, wham, we are gods. We are not touching anything tainted. We are not defiling ourselves with idols. So it's a really strong witness. And you feel so much joy and peace from the Lord. And you feel a freedom. You feel a complete freedom. It's a beautiful thing. Um, let me make sure I'm not missing other questions. I would say pretty well. Leads you to do, but don't pass a chance to be refined. Exactly, that's a good. That's good advice. Good advice, faith. Exactly. Um, I keep kosher. I have God. I have no problem with drinking. What advice do you have? Okay, okay, okay. I'm sorry. We talked about that one. Um, we're, we prayed for you. We'll keep praying for you. Yeah, and you're right, Kimberly. There's so many things. Um, did I miss any other question? If I've missed a question, would you just please copy and paste because I'm so far down here that now I don't even know where to go. I'm back. Okay. Let's keep reading. Okay, guys. Okay. So according, we're in chapter 10. I'm just going to start chapter 10, verse 1. Israel empties his vine. He's bring, he brings forth fruit for himself. According to the multitude of his fruit, he has increased the altars. According to the bounty of his land, they have embellished his sacred pillars. Their heart is divided. There are two things. Um, <laughs> you won't always know, Angela. You just let God lead you on that. That's just how he led me. Um, and I have a very, usually, like, my mother always said I remember being born. Like, she's, I, I just, so he blessed me with a memory that pretty much remembers everything. Like, I, if I read 300 pages, I'm going to remember nearly every word of every page and I'll, for whatever reason. Not everybody can do that. So if you can't remember everything where it's at, then just pray to him to show you what you need to do. Okay? He'll, he'll lead you. Okay. So did you hear that, guys? Their heart is divided. We don't want a divided heart. We want a singular dove's eyes, right? Singular heart, dove's eyes. Now they are held guilty. He will break down their altars. He will ruin their sacred pillars. For now they say, we have no king because we did not fear Yahweh. And as for a king, what would he do for us? They have spoken words, swearing falsely and making a covenant. Their judgment springs up like hemlock in the furrows of the field. The inhabitants of Samaria feel fear because of the calf of beth -Aven. I can speak, right? For its people mourn for it and its priests shriek for it because its glory has departed. So Yahweh destroyed their pagan idol. The idol also shall be carried to Assyria as a present to King Jareb. Ephraim shall receive shame and Israel shall be ashamed of his own counsel. As for Samaria, her king is cut off. So remember, that's where the king ruled from the 10 northern tribes of Israel. Judah had the Jewish king from the tribe of the house of David who was in Jerusalem. Israel 
had the king, their kings ruled from Samaria. Please remember that. The two different kingdoms had two different places of rule. Okay, so the inhabitants of Samaria fear because of the calf of Beth of En, for its people mourn for it and its priests shriek for it because its glory has departed from it. The idol also, did I just read that? I remember seven, I'm sorry. As for Samaria, her king is cut off like a twig on the water. Also the high places of Aven, the sin of Israel, shall be destroyed. The thorn and thistle shall grow on their altars. They shall say to the mountains, cover us, and to the hills, fall on us. O Israel, you have sinned from the days of Gibeah. Gibeah. <laughs> Why did I say Gibeah? Anyway, um, remember we just talked about what happened in Gibeah where the vile men wanted to rape the men, man, but then they ended up raping the concubine and she died. There they stood, the battle in Gibeah against the children of iniquity, right? So the, the children of Israel came against the Benjamites who had done this, and it did not overtake them. When it is my desire, I will chasten them, I will discipline them. People shall be gathered to, against them when I bind them for their two transgressions, Ephraim is a trained heifer that loves to thresh grain, but I harnessed her fair neck. I will make Ephraim pull a plow. Judah shall plow. Jacob shall break his clods. So for, so he's like, now you're going to come under my yoke. Um, and honestly, let me see something here. Um, I want to see what that means because I, I would like to look at the the Hebrew, but this was down. Let me see if it has it here. I want to see what it says there in the in the Hebrew for the. Um, does somebody have their blue letter Bible working there? Because mine is not right now. Where it says for their two transgressions. Oh, this one's saying it's referring to the past sin of Gibeah and the present sin of Israel. Okay, so that's what it, the footnote was saying. I don't know. I just want to know what do you guys think those two transgressions are? That's something honestly I've. Never even asked Yahweh about all these times I've read this. Um, so when I bind them for their two transgressions, so they're going to be yoked, they're going to be in trouble for these two transgressions. Obviously, one's Gibeah, because it's talking about that. What's the other one, I wonder? Hmm. Interesting. Ephraim is a trained heifer that loves to thresh grain, but I harnessed her fair neck. I will make Ephraim pull a plow. Judah shall plow. Jacob shall break his clods. Sow for yourselves righteousness Reach in mercy, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground for it is time to seek Yahweh till he comes and rains righteousness on you. One of my daughters, wow, that's that's amazing. Um, my mom used to say that as a joke to me because she's like, you must have been remembering me before. But that's interesting. I wonder if she had like a spiritual experience. Is she young? Is she older? Does she talk about it? Like, hmm, that's interesting. Okay, so verse 13, you have plowed wickedness, you have reaped iniquity, you have eaten the fruit of lies because you trusted in your own ways. In the multitude of your mighty men, therefore tumult shall arise among your people and all your fortresses shall be plundered. As Shalman plundered Beth Arbel in the day of battle, a mother dashed in pieces upon her children. Thus it shall be done to you, O Bethel. Because of your, now Bethel is one of the high places. Remember, you had Dan and Bethel where they went to worship. Those were like their places of worship. Samaria was where the king ruled. Oh, thanks, Kathy. I would love to hear it. Because of your great wickedness at dawn, the king of Israel shall be cut off utterly. When Israel was a child, chapter 11, when Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. Now that's a prophetic picture because in Hebrew, we say what happens to the Messiah will happen to Israel. And what happens to Israel will happen to the Messiah. Sometimes opposite word there. But there's a prophet. Remember, you see in the New Testament where it says there it may be said he called his son out of Israel, out of Egypt. I'm sorry, because Mary and Joseph, Miriam and Yosef took Yeshua to Egypt, and then they got called back to Israel. So out of Egypt I called my son, as they called them. So they went from them. They sacrificed to the Baals and burned incense to carved images. I taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by their arms. But they did not know that I healed them. I drew them with gentle cords, with bands of love, and I was to them as those who take the yoke from their neck. I stooped and fed them. Notice when he took the yoke from their neck, he also said, I gave them right rulings, my good law. So the yoke was not the law. The yoke was sin. He took the yoke of sin from us. We came out of Egypt. He broke that off. We take his light yoke of obedience. He shall not return to the land of Egypt, but the Assyrians shall be his king because they refused to repent. 
and the sword shall slash in his cities, devour his districts, and consume them because of their own counsels. My people are bent on backsliding from me. Though they call to the Most High, none at all exalt him. So he's like, they're calling to me, but they're not exalting me. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I set you like Zeboim? My heart churns within me. My sympathy is stirred. I will not execute the fierceness of my anger. We better be happy about that. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come with terror. They shall walk after Yahweh. He will roar like a lion, the Lion of Judah. When he roars, then his sons shall come, listen, then his sons shall come trembling from the west. Do who lives in the West? Where are the Western lands? Again, this is showing us that the 10 Northern tribes of Israel, when they got scattered, they went West. They went through Europe and they went to America. Good night, sweet girl. I love you, Cherry. Tell your babies good night. Kiss, kiss them. Well, they're probably already in bed, I'm sure. But you have a blessed day. Take care tomorrow and you be strong. You're M-I-L. You just be a witness for her, okay? I love you. So then his sons shall come trembling from the West. <laughs> We're in the West. They shall come trembling like a bird from Egypt. Oh, wait a minute. What's the end time Egypt? America in prophecy. Like a dove from the land of Assyria. And I will let them dwell in their houses, says Yahweh. Ephraim has encircled. So then he goes back and forth. So you keep seeing these pictures of where Yahweh calls out their sin through the prophet. And then he talks about redemption. Now we're turning back to a part of sin. Ephraim has encircled me with lies in the house of Israel with deceit, but Judah still walks with God, even with the Holy One is faithful. Twice now we've seen where Judah offends less. Judah stayed faithful to God, despite the fact that Ephraim went away. Now Judah still sinned. We saw different times where it says he was still being punished, but Judah offended less. Okay, that's just evident even in the book of Kings and Chronicles. Like we said, all of the kings of Israel were bad, Half of the kings of Judah were good. Verse chapter 12, I'm sorry. Ephraim feeds on the wind and pursues the east wind. He daily increases lies and desolation. Also, they make a covenant with the Assyrians and oil is carried to Egypt. Yahweh also brings a charge against Judah and will punish Jacob according to his ways. According to his deeds, he will recompense him. He took, listen, he took his brother by the heel in the womb and in his strength, he struggled with God. Jacob was wrestling with God in his own strength, his flesh. He was wrestling with God. To, he was holding on to his sin and in his strength, he was wrestling with God. Have you ever wrestled with God? Trying to give up smoking? Trying to give up drinking? Trying to give up eating that pig? You, When people are wrestling with God, so to speak, they're doing it in their power. Like, I'm going to do this. And God's like, no, you're not. <laughs> I want to do this. The people say, and Yahweh's like, do this. Right? You're wrestling with God. And that's what Jacob was doing. Now listen. In his strength, he struggled with God. Yes, he struggled with the angel. That's Yeshua. And prevailed. So he actually won. Like Jacob didn't give up. J Jacob won. But what happened? He wept and sought favor from him. Why? Why? He wept because he realized he sinned. He repented. He was remorseful. Does that make sense? I think a lot of people miss this passage when they talk about the story of Jacob and wrestling with the angel. But this is the part that always sticks out to me. So he struggled with the angel and prevailed. You can literally overcome God. Your, your flesh, your sin can overcome the truth of God. But then... When he strikes you in your hip, your weak area, to put you down, like, fine, then I'm just going to strike you. Then he weeps. Then you're supposed to weep, repent, and seek his favor and forgiveness. And that's what happened with Jacob. So Jacob would not let go. He was struck on the hip. But what did he say? He sought his favor. He wept and sought his favor. And what were the words we were told back in Genesis? I will not let you go unless you bless me. I will not let you go unless... So when you know you have been... I, I'm going to put this together in the words that I'm seeing. 
when you know, hi, good night, Nelly, love you. When you know you're in sin and you have fought with God and you pushed for your way and you refuse to repent, the minute you feel him strike you, you don't let go. You need to repent and break, be humbled and say, okay, ooh, man, I messed up, but I'm not letting go. You didn't save me at the beginning because I was good enough. You didn't save me because I was a wonderful person. You saved me because I needed salvation and I was a wretched soul. So I'm not letting go of you. Yes, I messed up, but I'm holding fast to your promises. Lord, you're the one who made the covenant to save me. Please don't let me go. And that's what the Father taught me 23 years ago, but right before I came to Torah. I didn't know a lot about visions and stuff. That I just always had visions and dreams, but I just, like, my family was not apostolic. <laughs> so I didn't, like, I didn't know what was happening to me. But every Sunday, I would, and granted, Sunday's not the Sabbath, please don't get me wrong. Yesh, I was still smoking. And Yeshua would come to me, and I would see him in these long white robes, and he'd come to me, and then I would be smoking, and he would turn from me, and I would grab his zitziot. At the time, I did, well, zitziot is singular, zitziot is plural. I would grab the zizi and his shawl. I didn't even know what I was seeing at the time. I had no idea of anything. Even though my family was Jewish, we just were very mainstream Christian. I didn't even understand until I came to Torah. I'm like, oh my gosh, I was grabbing the delete. <laughs> um, and I would grab it and I would say, you're not letting me go. You're not letting me go. Like I would literally have this vision and say this with him. And he reminded me of that when I read this years and years ago, 20 some years ago. And he said, if you want to be Israel, he said, what you must do is overcome. He goes, when you are in your sin and when you have messed up, that is the point where you cannot let go of me. You must hold on with all your might and seek my favor. He goes, because you're all going to mess up. You don't need a savior on the good days, do you? You need a savior on those. I mean, not that we don't. You, please don't get me wrong. Don't twist the words. You get what I'm saying. We need him every day. But when we need his salvation and forgiveness and grace is when we blow it. And when we are weeping and seeking his favor, we don't let go. I mean, I'm not a sin on purpose type of person. So I, since when I come to Torah, if you tell me something's wrong, I don't do it. Right. Okay. I'm not that person, but I know many people who struggle. Like they'll know it's wrong and still do it. I'm more of an impulsive. Like <laughs> mine is usually, well, it's always. My sin is always I get hurt or then angry with my words. So yeah. And so I'll, <laughs> you yeah, know, right? I can't do that. I gotta keep control and self-control. But like if I get hurt, normally I'm normally I'm good. But when I'm not, it's ugly. And what the father reminds me in those moments, because what do we do? We feel shame when we make up. Like, so when I get, I don't get mean to people. I'm not a mean person. Like, I'm just not mean. But let's say my husband and I are fighting. Usually we don't fight because we just both try to stay very calm. But if somebody says something mean to me, sometimes I will just like be defensive back. That's my sin. And I'll be like, you can't speak to me like that. Like, how? why would you treat me like that? But I don't say those words, but you get what I'm saying. And immediately the Holy Spirit will convict me. Like, who do you think you are? You don't defend yourself. You stay humble. You stop. Well, I often feel like such a failure that I just like, oh, I just fail you all the time, God. Like, my goodness, I can't overcome this defensive nature in myself. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. And that's when he'll say, wrestle and overcome. Like, don't let me go. Don't let me go. And so I encourage you guys, don't let God go. If you're in the depths of sin, you must break. You gotta let go. You gotta let go before he strikes you on the hip and you can't walk anymore. You gotta let go. You need to seek his favor. And then if you sin, run to his arms and say, please forgive me, please forgive me, please help me. I love you, don't leave me. That is who Israel is. Israel's not perfect. Israel's the overcomer. So to overcome, you had to have something to overcome, right? And that would be your sin. And you do it with the power of Yahweh. We are all rebellious, horrible, evil, wicked people. 
But if you want to be an Israelite, you're the one who holds on to the end. You don't let go, okay? So he sought his sought favor from him. He found him at Bethel, and there he spoke. That is Yahweh Elohim Sivot. Yahweh is his memorable name. So you, by the help of your God, return. How, how do we return? Observe mercy and justice and wait on your God continually. Wait on him. Don't run to the internet. Don't run here. Don't panic. Wait on him. Wait on him. That's a com time frame of a period of time where it's not instant. You must wait, slow down, stop, wait, rest, be expectant. A cunning Canaanite, deceitful scales are in his hand. He loves to oppress. And Ephraim said, surely I have become rich. I have found wealth for myself in all my labors. They shall find in me no iniquity that sin. And doesn't that sound like a lot of Christians? Very wealthy, very rich. And like, I'm not doing anything wrong. But here's what Yahweh says in verse nine. I am Yahweh, your God, who ever since the land of Egypt, I will make you again dwell in tents as in the day of the appointed feast. What's that appointed feast, guys? What feast were we commanded when we're in Jerusalem to dwell in tents with, were commanded to dwell in tents during the Feast of Tabernacles, Feast of Sukkot, right? And that's the, in Zechariah chapter 14. It says when Jesus returns after the tribulation, everybody must come to Jerusalem to keep the Feast of Tabernacles or you won't get any rain. Like, this is forever, not just before Messiah. That's a prophecy of the millennial kingdom. Good job, guys. And so we, he tells us in Leviticus, we dwell in tents to remember that we dwelt in tents and that he was our shelter in the wilderness. It's also, we're going to be dwelling with him, like in eternity, like in the millennial reign. So he's our, that's like the marriage ceremony, the celebration, the harvest. It's after the harvest of his people. Verse 10 of 12, I have also spoken by the prophets and have multiplied visions. I have given symbols through the witness of the prophets. Though Gilead has idols, surely they are vanity. Though they sacrifice bulls in Gilgal, indeed their altars shall be heaps in the frills of the field. Jacob fled to the country of Syria. Israel served for a spouse. Jacob and Israel is the same person, remember? His name was changed. And for a wife he tended sheep. By a prophet, Yahweh brought Israel out of Egypt. Now it switched from the person Israel to the nation of Israel, the children of Israel. And by a prophet, he was reserved. And that prophet was Moses, who was symbolic of Messiah. Ephraim provoked him to anger most bitterly. Therefore, his Yahweh will leave the guilt of his bloodshed upon him and return his approach upon him. <coughs> we we'll have two more chapters. We may as well finish, right? When Ephraim spoke trembling, so when he was humble, okay. Isabel said, I set up a tent in the backyard. Oh, awesome, Isabel. When Ephraim spoke trembling, he exalted himself in Israel. So by his humility, God was able to exalt him. But when he off offended through Baal worship, he died. Now they sin more and more and have made for themselves molded images, idols of their silver according to their skill, all of it the work of craftsmen. They say of them, let the men who sacrifice kiss the calves. Therefore they shall be like the morning cloud and like the early dew that passes away, like chaff blown off from the threshing floor and like smoke from a chimney. Yet I am Yahweh your Elohim ever since the land of Egypt. And you shall know no God but me, for there's no savior besides me. I knew you in the wilderness, in the land of great drought. When they had pasture, they were filled. They were filled and their heart was exalted. There, Therefore, they forgot me. Don't you often feel that in life when things are going well and we're kind of filled spiritually and physically? When we have things going really well, we exalt ourselves and we forget our God. Not, I mean, not we. I don't say we do this all the time. But I think it's human nature is what I say by we. Humans tend to, if we're too comfortable, we forget God or reject God or ascribe greatness to our own selves. When we're in the dire straits of the pits, we're like, oh, God, save me, God, save me, God, save me. And then we remember him. So sometimes those blessings and those times of trials and, and tribulations are actually the best times of our life because at least then we're relying on God and closer to him. Good night. Get some rest, sweet Daniel. Okay, we're, we have one more chapter. Shabbat Shalom. Yeah, okay, perfect. So I will be to them like a lion, like a leopard by the road. I will lurk. I will meet them like a bear deprived of her cubs. So if you have dreams about lions, bears, and mountain lions, be very careful to this. It's usually symbolic if there is a sin in your life that Yahweh is coming against you for, okay? A lot of people, when they come to Torah, they share their dreams with me, and 
when they have those dreams and like, okay, so what, let's, let's look at what you're still doing. There's a bear coming after you. There's the mountain lion. That's Yahweh coming after you. What is he sending to you? What sin is in your life? And so we try to uncover that. Um, I will meet them like a bear deprived of her cubs. I will tear open their rib cage and there I will devour them like a lion. The wild beast shall tear them. Oh, Israel, you're destroyed, but your help is from me. I will be your king. I love that. Where is any other that he may save you in all your cities and your judges to whom you said, give me a king and princes. I gave you a king in my anger. Remember when he made Saul king? It was, it was a bad thing. He didn't want to do that. And took him away in my wrath. So he took the king away in his wrath, not for a good thing. The, the iniquity of Ephraim is bound up. Sorry. His sin is stored up. The sorrows of a woman in childbirth shall come upon him. He is like an un, he is an unwise son, for he shall not stay long where children are born. This is talking about the, the, the milk of the word. He shouldn't stay where children are born. We don't stay on the milk of the word. We don't stay at the beginning. We're just born again. It's just all about Jesus. Well, we're supposed to go on to the meat of the word and understand what we're talking about. Does that make sense? We don't stay where the children are born, where we're born again. We need to go forward and progress. I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be your plagues. O grave, I will be your destruction. Pity is hidden from my eyes, though he is fruitful among his brethren. That's Ephraim, here in America, very fruitful. An east wind shall, well, Europe and America. An east wind shall come. Ooh, the kings of the east are coming soon. Like, remember the Euphrates is drying up, so the kings of the east, Gog and Magog, which are Russia and China, are coming. An east wind shall dry them up. The wind of Yahweh shall come up from the wilderness. Then his spring shall become dry and his fountain shall be dried up. He shall plunder the treasury of every desirable prize. Samaria is held guilty. That's where the kings lived. For she has rebelled against her God. They shall fall by the sword. Their infants shall be dashed in pieces and their women with, ch with child ripped open. O Israel, return to Yahweh your Elohim, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take words with you and return to Yahweh. Say to him, take away all iniquity. Receive us graciously, for we will offer the sacrifices of our lips. Assyria shall not save us. We will not ride on horses, nor will we say any more to the work of our hands. You are our gods, for in you the fatherless finds mercy. There's a passage in Isaiah. Is it Isaiah? Yeah. It says that Abraham is our father, but doubtless they were, he didn't under, he didn't know it. Like the children of Israel don't accept him. Let me find that. I think it's in Jeremiah or Isaiah. Um, another verse that goes right with this. It talks about doubtless you are our father, but Israel does not acknowledge us. And it's talking about the children of Israel being dispersed. Okay. Um, yes, we do. Okay. Let's keep going. Um, for in you, the father, fatherless finds mercy. Verse four, I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely for my anger has turned away from him. I will be like the dew to Israel and he shall grow like a lily and lengthen his roots like Lebanon. His branches shall spread. His beauty shall be like an olive tree and his fragrance like Lebanon. Those who dwell under his shadow shall be turned. They shall be revived like grain and grow like a wine. Their scent shall be like the wine of Lebanon. Ephraim shall say, what have I to do any more with idols? I have heard and observed him. I am like a green cypress tree. Your fruit is found in me. Who is wise? Let him understand these things. Who is prudent? Let him know them. For the ways of Yahweh are right. The righteous walk in them, but transgressors stumble in them. Did you guys learn anything tonight? I hope that was good. Did you learn anything going through the book of Hosea? Was it? Or, or well, some of you might have just been very familiar with that and known all those things, but did you guys, hopefully you learned something. What was the most, um, I don't know, what was the most eye-opening thing for you tonight? What did you learn? What really stood out to you? Anybody? And yeah. Awesome. I'm glad, let me get my sweater back on. I got chilled because I was sweating so bad that now <laughs> I got chilled. So I'm going to put my sweater back on. Old women like sweaters, don't we? Anyway. Yeah, so well, um, any you guys have anything you want? Questions? Yeah, okay, chapter 12, verse 6, as I just closed my Bible. <laughs> oh, that was really handy, wasn't it? Didn't close it. Um, yeah, so he will, oh, right, 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 that's, I like that one too, Joe, and I'm going to look at what the 12, 6 is. Awesome. And then... Yeah. 
That's awesome. Okay. Well, guys, do you have any questions? I'm sorry, I had to step away. No worries, Mary, this will all be posted on the page if you want to just watch the full thing again. Um, okay, does anybody have any questions? Okay, if you do have any questions, let me reach out, because I, I know you guys were kind of talking earlier and Danielle was helping answer some of those praise Yahweh. Um, perfect, okay. So you, by the help of your God, return, yeah. That's it's beautiful, isn't it? We should we need to observe mercy and justice. Oh, that's the heart of the Torah, because Yeshua even says he goes, you you tithe the mint and the anise, you do all these things, and you should do those, but do not leave the weightier matters undone, right? Like justice and mercy. Okay, I do pray, Father God, you help Faith with whatever she's going through. Please deliver her, guide her, lead her, show her your way and just mightily be there for her, her in her life. Just please, Father God, help her to know what to do, guide and direct her in every way. In the name of Yeshua. Okay, guys. Well, don't forget, um, tomorrow we'll be live. Um, well, well, thank you, sweet sister. I love you. And then, um, I'm gonna try to do the children's one at nine, mountain time. And we'll be going through chapter two. And I think, praise Yahweh, Shabbat Shalom. I believe that, um, I pray that we all get good night's sleep. May Yahweh bless you with dreams and visions from him. May he make us all white for him, refine us for him. Yahweh bless you. And guys, good night. Um, Shabbat Shalom. And I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just didn't make you yawn. <laughs>